Check, check. Welcome to the One Life, One Chance podcast. I'm your host, Toby Morse. Today, I have a very, very special guest. I'm truly honored to have this man in my house. Um, I'm going to give the big intro to him. He's a father, father of four, husband, best-selling author, ultra-endurance athlete, public speaker, plant-based, plant-based nutrition advocate, podcaster, superhero, and huge inspiration. <laughs> no. Mr. Rich Roll, thank you for being here. <laughs> I'm so happy to be here, man. Thanks for, <laughs> thanks for having me, man. Dude, that's a, that, Stoked to be in your home. That's a sick intro. That's, like a, lot, that's a lot of things covered. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was an intense intro, definitely. <laughs> um, I might be talking a little fast today because I haven't had caffeine since June, and I just had some, some caffeinated shit that Derek got for me. <laughs> you're um, drinking I, liquid death mountain water. We're, we're yes, we the, are. We are drinking the liquid death. <laughs> um, so before we get into all the things you've accomplished in your life, on this podcast, I'd like to dive a little deep and see what kind of inspired you to become where you are today. Um, so I'm going to take it back. I know we just talked about D.C. a few minutes ago. Where were you actually born? In, uh, in Detroit. Oh, a little shit. outside right. Detroit. Yeah, Detroit, yeah, yeah. Actually. So I spent the first six years of my life in Michigan. Everybody in my family is, is like a Michigan native. And you got siblings? Got one sister two years younger. Yeah, she just moved back to D.C. So we, I moved to D.C. when I was about seven, and that's really where I grew up. In D.C., yeah. Yeah. And, and so what was it like moving from Michigan to D.C.? Was like a kind of culture shock thing? Or, was, or were you too young? I mean, to really... I was too young, really. Yeah. I don't really, I have just the vaguest memories of, uh, of Michigan. I mean, the one thing was we had a bunch of cousins and stuff like that around. So when we moved to D.C., my dad got a job. He was a young lawyer. He got a job in the government, worked for the FTC. Uh, and that was his big dream. You know, he wanted to be, he wanted to be around what was happening in politics in Washington. You say yeah. the FTC? FTC, What's Federal that? Trade Commission. Okay. So he was like working on um, busting up like anti-competitive practices and price fixing and stuff like that. That was like his first gig. That's in cool. Washington, yeah. I haven't even heard of that before. That's awesome. Um, how, so how was it growing up there? Like how were you? How were you growing up as a kid? Like how were you in school and stuff? I mean, I I was uh you know I was a really quiet, shy, sensitive kid. I was the kid who you know had trouble making friends and you know, was occasionally getting the shit beat out of me on the playground and getting my, you know, winter hat stolen at the bus stop. You know, I was that kid. I was rocking uh, the headgear or the doncha and I had an eye patch on one eye. So, you know, I was not, I was not a vision for you as a a kid. You had an eye patch? I had an eye patch. Yeah, I got a, I got a weak eye. So the thinking was you put the patch on the strong eye and you try to strengthen the weak eye. Yeah, the lazy it eye. Yeah, it didn't really work. I still got a weak eye. That, wow. wait, I just had to put in one note. I, I, I know that you're born October 20th. Yeah, you my, did your research. My brother is born October 20th and he had a patch too. No way. What? Yes. No way. I swear to God. I like wow. you on caffeine. You're really interested. Yeah, it's, it's, I don't think they do that anymore. I don't, I don't think so either. You know. <laughs> <laughs> they realize it doesn't real? work. It's real, man. That's, yeah. Your that's... brother had a patch too? Yes. He had a, uh-huh. a weak eye. A wow, lazy eye. Dude. And, they used to yeah. get, and I used to steal his patches and pretend I was a pirate. You know? uh, was, did you, did you pick on me now? No, my mom was like, yo, you're going to get a lazy eye if you keep doing that. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so did you like school? I, uh, I wasn't very good at school when I was young. I, I, had, you know, I had a lot of trouble trying to keep up. And my parents knew, noticed that, and they pulled me out of public school and put me in like a parochial school and elementary school. Wow! And I kind of found my tribe. It was like a real, uh, like nurturing environment, and that was awesome. like a really good place for me. But then when elementary school was over, I had to find another school to go to, and I ended up going to this boys prep school called Land- the Landon School for Boys. Uh-oh. Wow! That so it was the full, <laughs> you know carpe diem situation with uh you know it's all about lacrosse and football and like everything that you would imagine that kind of school to be was exactly what it was and it was not the right fit for me like i just was you know it was oil and water and i really struggled uh so no sports for you well what happened was um during the summers like in dc there's like little summer pools in the neighborhoods and they would have little swim teams a little swim league and and uh, I did that when I was, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten, and that was the one thing that I actually was kind of good at, like naturally. Um, so I just started swimming more, and there was no swimming program at my at my school, but I'd gotten relatively good at that sport. And when I got to Landon, they have this mandatory, you know, alpha male kind of sports situation, and I wanted to get exempted from that so I could go train and. Um, with a club swimming program, yeah, because um, I that was like that was like my passion. That was like everything. You know, I wanted to I wanted to be great at swimming, 
and they just were not having it. And I had to go through all kinds of fucking crazy shenanigans. And to this day, I think I'm the only person who's ever been exempted from that sports program. Wow. And all I wanted to do was swim so I could be like a real athlete. Yeah. And they ultimately relented and let, it, let me out. You know, and I ended up creating a swim program at the school so I could compete in the high school championships. And now there is a, there's a swim team there now that like I helped create back wow, in that that's time. Cool. Yeah. That's awesome. So, so right away, that was like your thing. You connected to swimming. Yeah, I mean, swimming was, you know, I, 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 I call it like my first drug of choice, but it was also like my passion. And I think it was, it was a, um, you know, kind of a safe place for me. So, you know, being this kid who was confused and having difficulty making friends and, you know, insecure and, you know, all of that, all those confusing emotions that you have when you're a young kid, when I was at the pool or underwater, you know, it was like, not only did I feel at home, but there's like a quietness with that. Like all the, Peaceful. all the confusion and problems that I had just got muted, you know, when I was submerged. And yeah. so I just really gravitated towards that environment. So it was, uh, you know, equal parts escape, but also, you know, something that I looked at as like, this is my, this is my path. And this is like my way out of, you know, this is going to, this is going to be the thing that's going to take me where I want to go. Yeah. But, I love that. Was there a person like that taught you the fundamentals of swimming, like a coach or somebody mm. that inspired you to to get you into swimming? Well, I learned when I was living in Michigan, you know, I learned how to swim there. And I had uh, like some cousins who were like competitive swimmers. My I didn't when I was young, I didn't even know this, but I had a grandfather, my mother's father, who passed away before I was born. But he had been an incredible swimmer. He was captain of the University of Michigan swim team in like 1929 uh, and was an Olympic hopeful and had an American record. And, you know, he was, I had, and I was named out, his name was Richard. I was named after him. So I was sort of like fulfilling his legacy without even being aware of it. Yeah. That's awesome. And how, and how are your parents? Did you have like, you guys a religious family? You guys a strict family, your parents? or? Um, not strictly religious, but there was Sunday school and going to the Presbyterian church on Sunday and that kind of thing was yeah. part of my, my upbringing. They weren't very hardcore about it, though, um, but it was very much a, an achievement education first kind of household where expectations were set. I was the oldest, you know, and, and mm. there was definitely this sense like you, you know, you need to work hard and study hard and that's how you, you know, become successful in the world. And so that kind of set in motion me chasing approval of my parents and trying to fulfill, you know, that promise for them, but yeah. always falling short and never really getting, <laughs> you know, getting the pat on the back that I was always looking for. And, you know, that becomes pathologized as you get older and, you know, sure. has, has like, you know, compelled me to make some bad decisions in my life. Mm. So um, how were your grades? You see, you kept great grades and stuff. So the more immersed I got in swimming, I realized when I when I arrived at this club team, like I was surrounded by like really talented kids who were, you know, breaking national age group records and, you know, competing at the highest level for young people at that time. And I certainly I was okay, but I wasn't that. Um, And I knew that I didn't have that level of innate talent. Um, But what I did realize was that I had this like workhorse capacity. Like I, I, I figured out early and often that if I put in more work than these other kids, I could bridge that gap and get up to speed. And I was successful in doing that. That's so awesome. I would put in like massive hours, like throughout high school, I was, I got up every morning at 445, Damn. swam for an hour and a half before school, went to school, went back to the pool, two more hours in the pool. And I would do these crazy butterfly sets that like no one would ever do. And that wow. really um, propelled me like kind of expedite, expedited my arc so that by the time I was a senior in high school, I was one of the top swimmers in the region. But that taught me also that I could apply that in my academic career. So, you know, that kid who really struggled in school, like I kind of sorted it out and figured it out and realized yeah. like if I study really hard, I can, I can, you know, get, get, get up on top. And so I, I graduated high school, like not, I wasn't like, the valedictorian, but I was in the top, you know, three or five kids in my class. That's awesome. And did you get more confidence? And when you started becoming a swimmer, making new friends, I know before you were saying like you got picked on, you kind of like quiet and shy. Did that help you kind of 
Yeah, I mean, this, the the kids that I was swimming with, that was my tribe. Like, yeah, I didn't really cool. have a social life in high school, and I was too fucking exhausted anyway because I was waking <laughs> up at 4 o'clock in the morning. That's crazy. So all I did was swim and study, and I would crash out at 9 o'clock. And on the weekends when all the kids I went to high school with were partying and drinking and getting into trouble, like, I was either traveling to a swim meet or just, you know, training or, or too tired. So I was definitely like a goody two-shoes yeah. who had a lot of judgment about – you know, kids that were partying and stuff mm. like that. Little did they, you know, little did I know that yeah, I was kind of straight edge without declaring <laughs> myself straight edge. Um, yeah. That all unraveled pretty quickly later, but, um, but that's yeah. kind of how it was. But you didn't try any drugs and alcohol while you're in school? No, not in high school. Wow. Yeah. So what did you want to do at that point? Like what, what was your goals to do when you graduated? I mean, I thought, I thought, um, I thought maybe I'd be a doctor. I thought maybe I'd go into politics. Like I grew up immersed in politics. Yeah. Um, like I said, my dad was a was a government lawyer, and then he went into private practice. But I lived in like a suburb of Washington, and you know everybody in the way that Los Angeles is a corporate town. Like everybody's in entertainment. Like DC is a corporate town, and all you do is talk about politics, and you're surrounded by either politicians or people that have some tangential relationship to government in some regard. So you're always talking about stuff like yeah. we're very politically conscious right now in this moment because of how heated the election cycle is. Yes. But five years ago, were we talking about politics the way that we're talking about it now? No. no, but I grew up kind of around that and I knew more about what was going on in politics when I was in high school than I did until relatively recently, you know, that we've all been like thrust into this environment. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like down my street, I mean, my next door neighbor growing up in high school was Senator Bob Packwood. He was a Senator from Oregon and he was the guy who was the first guy to go down in a sexual harassment lawsuit oh, yeah. first me too, back in the yeah. day. This was like surprise, 1983 surprise. or something like that. Wow. Around the corner was the director of the FBI. And so when it would snow, our street would always be like the first street plowed because they had to make sure that high ranking government officials could like get to work, like all this That's weird stuff that nice. goes down in DC. <laughs> yeah, and then at this prestigious prep school that I went to, like a lot of the kids were, were the sons of, you know, prominent politicians in Washington. So I was very much steeped in that at that time. Yeah, that's fucking. So, so when you graduate, what happens? So, I graduate high school and, you know, I'm, I'm like set up for like unbelievable success. Okay. Like the world is like at my feet yes. because I got into every college that I applied to. Wow. I got into Harvard, Stanford, Princeton, Amherst, UVA, University of Michigan. Like I was Holy eight, I was shit. eight for eight. Like I didn't even apply to any, any safety schools. Like I just fucking rocked it. Wow. Um, and swimming helped because I was recruited to be a swimmer at all of these places. So that really, you know, if it was purely academic, I wouldn't have gotten in, but the combination of those two things, like really, wow. you know, laid the world at my feet. And, and you know, so there was a lot of promise, but also expectations built Pressure. into that. Like, mm -hmm. okay, now you're, you're the golden kid. Like, what are you gonna do? And I was initially gonna go to Harvard. I told the swim coach at Harvard, I'm in, I'm going. If I get in, I'm definitely going. I visited Stanford at the last minute yeah, um, and I, you know, I'd never been to California <laughs> right. before and I, you know, driving down Palm drive and you see that church and you're just like, holy shit. Yeah. Like, this is like yeah. something I've never seen before. And at the time Stanford had the number one swimming program in the country. And, and there was just no way I was going to turn down the opportunity to compete with and train with world record holders, NC2A champions, Olympic gold medalists, yeah. and be at this unbelievable, it was like the best of both worlds. So, you know, said no to Harvard, which, you know, is fucking crazy That's because so who crazy, says man. no to that? When you get into Harvard, they send you this piece of paper that looks like a fucking <laughs> diploma. Like your name is in calligraphy in it. And you're like, who the fuck am I to say no to something That's like cool. this? Um, but you know, I, I loved everything about Stanford and, um, I love being part of that team, like in DC and in my high school, like swimming like who cares about that but you go to stanford and you're like that you're like a big man on campus if you're on the swim team so yeah my whole like social paradigm shifted when i arrived there and it was this really beautiful permissive culture that was there to nurture your dreams like at, in, a, in a in a kind of constrictive east coast 
Ivy League environment, it's like, oh, it's all about academics. You got to choose. You can, you know, like, what yeah. do you, you know, but at Stanford, they're like, oh, you want to be great at swimming and you want to, you know, study this? Like, we're here to support you. We think you can do whatever it is you set your mind to. And there was something really liberating about that that yeah. I was very attracted to. And I loved everything about it. But, you know, it didn't take long before partying and booze like entered the equation. And, mm. you know, that started to, uh, that, you know, I didn't waste too much time in, 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 you know, indulging, and that started to really erode, you know, my life over time. I want to say you're probably, so, the, you're probably the smartest person to have the podcast so no. far. It's turned down Yale. No. Um, it's so, it's or amazing. Harvard. So you get to college, and now it's like a whole new world, like you said. Like, now it's like, not that it wasn't cool to be on the swim team in high school, but when you go there, it's like some next level. So you're not like the black sheep so much. Now you're on something, doing something yeah. cool, right? And like, like in my bedroom at home in high school, I had like a, you know, one whole wall was like a cork board and I would just put up like, you know, pictures of my heroes. And it was just, it was just literally a collage of like all of these swimming heroes that I had. And suddenly I was like their teammate, you know, like wow, these guys that man. were like, you know, at the highest level, suddenly like I was sharing a lane with them. And to be clear, like I was good. I was never going to be in the Olympics. Like I was a bench warmer at Stanford. Like I was, I was really not recruited at Stanford. I was more like, I wasn't quite a walk on, but it wasn't like I got a scholarship to go to school there or anything like that. And okay. so I showed up like, I need to prove myself, you know, I'm going to, I, I'm going to like apply that, you know, hard work ethic to this and try to, you know, make sure that I can be, you know, a, a point scorer and a, you know, a breadwinner on this team. Yeah. But, you know, booze had other ideas for me. How, how soon were you there when you got exposed to like started part? Like how long were you on the campus? I mean, I, you know, the first, I started getting exposed to booze. Like when I went on the, I would go on these recruiting trips when mm. I was a senior in high school where you get flown out and they show you a good time. Yes. I was at the university of Michigan, um, on a recruiting trip, uh, and, uh, you know, I have this like family legacy with that because of my grandfather, whose coach was this guy called Matt Mann, who was a legendary swim coach at the time, like University of Michigan in that era was kind of like what Stanford was in the 80s. And the, the natatorium was called the Matt Mann pool. It was like named after this coach that had coached my grandfather. So I went there, not because I was, you know, like, I thought that I might go to Michigan, but more because like, this is like part of my family heritage. Yeah. Um, and I was at a party after a swim meet, all the swimmers were there, they're tapping the keg, everyone's having a good time. And this guy called Bruce Kimball, who was the number one diver in the, in the world at that time, other than Greg Luganis, was, whose father was the diving coach at Michigan, um, gave me his, his, the diving coach was called Dick Kimball, his dad, uh, you know, handed me a beer and we're like, sh you know, it's like, he hands me his beer and I'm like, fuck if I'm not going to, you know, yeah get drunk with Bruce Kimball and he proceeds to pull off like the greatest party trick that I'd ever seen while he's holding like a, a thing like this of, you know, like a yeah. plastic cup of beer from a flat footed stance. He launches himself into the air and does a perfect backflip and just like sticks the landing while he's holding the beer what? and he doesn't spill a fucking ounce of it. <laughs> I was like, how the fuck do you, that's do? I go, oh that's God. the greatest party trick I've ever seen. Wow. And whatever this guy has, like, that's what I want. You know, right. and ended up like hanging out with him all night and getting loaded and just, you know, I had that feeling that you hear about with recovering alcoholics where when you get drunk for the first time, it's like you, you're being enveloped in this warm blanket and all those weird emotions and that, sense of discomfort with yourself vanishes it just evaporates wow. and you feel you feel like yourself mm -hmm. you know that's like i, I it, it's difficult to explain um and i just thought like more of this please you were know you, and, we, and that was really the initiation were you curious about it in high school were you curious to try it or you didn't really care about it you just focused on swimming i was so i was really judgmental and i was very focused on swimming i was very driven and I was like, I don't have time for that. I don't understand these kids who are like wasting their fucking lives doing this. Sounds like a militant you know? straight yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, Absolutely. I was like that. And I, I, I had a lot of judgment against, you know, kids mm -hmm. that I knew who were doing that. Um, but then when I experienced it for myself, I was like, now I see what it's all about. Mm. And I just, you know, it wasn't like, you know, it would be years before I would consciously come to the conclusion that I was an alcoholic. But yeah. I think from the very beginning, I knew in my heart of hearts that my relationship with this was unhealthy and more severe than those around me. Like, yeah. you know, I was, it w you know, 
immediately I would be the last guy to leave the party okay. or the guy looking, drinking the half empties around the room and, Ooh, you know, damn. getting yeah. the most drunk or blacking out or doing the embarrassing thing. Like I just became that guy. And did it affect your swimming and all your, and all yeah, your it killed my swimming career. I mean, my freshman year, I, I, you know, I, I was able to go from total walk on to being somebody that, you know, I was, I was having some early success and some meets and butterfly, and, butterfly swimmer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you know, the coach was like, I can't believe, you know, like I got, I got like a most valuable swimmer in our first dual meet against Texas. And, you know, all eyes were on me like, Oh, this guy's You know, he's going to, he's going to make it happen. And you were then, doing what you set out to do. Yeah. And then, uh, I never really swam. you know, after my freshman year, I just never really swam fast again. I stayed on the team. I ended up quitting. I didn't swim my senior year, but it was just kind of a downhill slide from there. So I never really realized my athletic potential. Wow. Did you have an addictive personality before that? Addictive in the sense that I was really driven. And I yeah. think I had an addictive relationship with, um, with my commitment to swimming mm -hmm. and to success. Yeah. I was definitely a workaholic from the get go. So, so after the first year, it's kind of, I mean, I'm still, I mean, what happens is you cut you, there's this weird thing that's very specific to alcoholism where you simultaneously believe that you're better than everyone else. Like I can go party till three in the morning and get up at five 30 in the morning and still go to swim practice Kill and it. get good grades and do, do it like this Superman complex Yeah. while also believing that you're a total piece of shit and a fraud and you don't deserve to breathe the same air that everyone else is breathing. Damn. Fuck! Imagine if, if, imagine if I ever tried alcohol. If I would turn out, did some shit like that. Because I never tried. So anything. you've never, you've never tried never alcohol, tried a sip, right? Never tried yeah. a cigarette, a joint, nothing. Like it's, if I try that, yeah, it's hard to say. You know, it's hard to know. And then I can, I can definitely relate to the fact of not doing any drugs or anything in high school. Yeah, you were straight edge like that too until you. Yeah, mm -hmm. and driven by sports, doing sports my my whole high school career, and uh, and I had a question for you about discipline. You know. I know a lot of young kids, especially nowadays, I, it's very difficult for them to be disciplined, to stay focused on one thing, mm -hmm. you know, and to follow through with a, a lot of things. And especially with sports, there's so much dedication and, 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 and focus that you need. And I was always curious, like, from all the achievements that you've done and everything, like, at a very young age, what was there like what drove you to like what was in your mind while you were doing those things you know that put you over the top because when you're yeah. doing certain sports you get into a mindset that i had to be taught you know from a coach i had coaches like you're the best you're gonna be the best you're better than those kids <laughs> uh -huh. up there at school they're lazy they're not doing anything they're <laughs> sleeping now and you're here at five in the morning yeah in the weight room you're gonna go to class and you're gonna come back and train again you're better than them there's something in you you have more heart you know, it's yeah. so I needed to be taught that like that was something that was actually very good for me to learn. And it stuck with me my entire life, that formal training in sports. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering, like from you, it sounds like it came. I don't know where it's, where it's coming from, you know. Yeah, I think that <clears throat> it, it was innate, like no one taught me how to be okay. disciplined. Like that really came from within, like discipline's never been a problem okay. for me. Like I can get the tunnel focus on something and then just the whole world disappears and it's just you know, I can charge in that one direction that. towards okay, that yeah, thing. Yeah. But I think from, you know, a, a pathology point of view, it's probably all motivated by a desire to be accepted. Like, I'm okay. not good enough, but if I win this race or I, you know, get these grades or whatever, then, you know, my parents will accept me or I'll be accepted by this peer group. Like, it was never about winning or beating other people. It was always driven by wanting to be part of a community. And I think that's why I love being on the Stanford swim team so much or what, you know, it was like, yeah. I didn't care whether I was winning or losing. Like, I just wanted to be part of the, 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 the cool group, you yeah. know? And this was the uh, one, the, this was like my avenue for achieving that. Amazing. Amazing. That's a really great question. Yeah. It's yeah. just always, I've always wondered this because I know it's something very unique, you know, like to be able to push you know, your mind over your body, mm -hmm. you know, your body is just suffering and suffering. I remember in practice, like people are throwing up and they're like, nobody's sitting on the mats. Cause yeah. I did wrestling. Like nobody sits the entire practice, you know, and they're pushing you and you never imagine your body could do so much, right. but it, it had to be taught to me mentally to get in that state of mind. You know, it was, it wasn't never 
something that easy for me. Mm. It was just determined though. Like, yeah, I was yeah. very, I was, you know, I'd be throwing up in the gutter at swim right. practice and everybody would be getting out and I'd be like, give me another one. Right. You know, I was like that guy, right. you know, cause, cause I was getting success and I knew that if I just kept doubling down that I was going to compound, you know, my, my opportunity for getting what I wanted. I kind of love, I love that. <laughs> I, I, yeah. It's really, when I hear people's stories like his and people with experience with drugs and alcohol, I'm like, not that I'm saying that I wish I would have done that as a kid and mm-hmm. tried things in life, but like I, I made a commitment and conviction at 13 years old once I saw my brothers drinking and smoking. I'm like, I'm never doing that shit. Those guys scare me when they're high. But I never did it after that at 13. And I'm, I'm like so immature to even think that way at 13. Mm-hmm. Like I'm not going to do anything. Thing. But then opposite, like he experienced that. And I don't know. But it's, you know, that same drive of like, give me more, I'll work harder is an addictive trait, right? Yeah, the idea yeah, is yeah. like more is always better, right? right? Like more yeah. work, more studying, more swim practice, more booze. I see. You know? Okay. Yeah. yeah. But the, but you had but you had friends there that were partying just as hard as you as well, right? Yeah, I mean that's the thing. Like you can kind of hide out because that's part of the culture in college or when you're in your, you know, like mm-hmm. late teens and early twenties, right? Yeah. So whatever, you know, kind of shenanigans I'd find myself in were easily written off because mm-hmm. it's just all in good fun. But, you know, as the disease progresses and, you know, the friends start you know, cooling their jets a little bit more and you're ramping up even right. more. Going it starts, it, you know, you got to start, you start like, you know, trying to find new friends, you know, yeah. the lower, the lower companions who right. want to, who want to roll with you. Yes. And it starts yeah, to get yeah. darker and the consequences become a little bit more dire and it's not so funny anymore. And then it becomes really sad, pathetic and lonely. Maybe, maybe not, maybe no one from the swim team, like just other people, right? Like yeah. Different side of the crowd. Yeah. I mean, like I, you know, I got through college and it was fine. And then I moved to New York City and that was like Disneyland for alcoholics and the party and really kicked up a notch even though I was like making no money like I had a blast but you know I it just you know it started to get a little bit crazier and you're you're out at like after hours parties at like four in the morning all the time um yeah you know and and you know then you know five six years later you're drinking alone in your apartment and you know <laughs> blacking out and crashing oh, cars sick. and losing cars oh, and get arrested you know oh, yeah get, i got you know ultimately you know it ended up coming to a head for me i mean i i'd been drinking for you know 15 years just alcohol. i went to law well I, I lived in new york city then i went to law school in upstate new york yeah. somehow graduated law school got a job as a lawyer in san francisco and it was really unhappy in that job and was drinking a lot but that's when i started drinking more and more alone and then i got a job in la and you know i was used to driving drunk but taking back roads and figuring out how to like do it on the sly but you moved to la and that shit ain't gonna fly for me so it didn't it was like maybe like a month and a half after i moved down here i got pulled over for my first dui i was Wow. Um, coming home from a bar on Melrose, it was like three in the morning and I, and I rear ended a woman at oh, the intersection oh, of Melrose and Crescent Heights at like two thirty in the morning, Wow! blew a two nine, went to jail two months later, did it again, driving the wrong way down a one way street in Beverly Hills, pulled it, blew a two seven, oh, the God. arresting officer took my wallet, saw my business card and my boss, the lawyer that I was working with at the time in this law firm. Um, was was legal counsel to the Beverly Hills and the LAPD. So wow. so the cop called my boss and said I picked up one of your boys and you know my boss called me in and it was it was fucking bad. I thought I was getting fired and I was certainly yeah. going to jail. Like you don't get away with not going to jail after no, two man. DUIs back to back. And what happened was, um, the first the the court in the first. DUI that I got lost the docket, like lost the file, and I never got prosecuted for that DUI. And I ended up wow. getting off on probation. And that was like the first God shot, like someone's looking out <laughs> yeah. for me. And that was my first introduction to trying to get sober, which didn't stick. Initially, I had to, you know, go through a lot of more a lot more pain and stuff like that before I was really, you know, willing to reckon with the real problem. But um, yeah, a lot of a lot of, you know, pain and a lot of, you know, pathetic behavior and and you know, height, you know, shame and yeah. embarrassment and, you know, living this double life. And it takes a lot of energy to keep that up. Yeah. How old were you then when you got those DUIs? 29, 30. But yeah, I think about 30. And, and what were your parents thinking when you, when you dropped out of college? I mean, 
they i mean i didn't drop out of college i just i quit swimming I quit, my quit. senior year okay, yeah, yeah i mean I, I think they were okay with that i mean they never really had a sense of what i was really doing until they came to my law school graduation and i was just like hammered the whole time and it wow. was like it was like not cool and is alcoholism running your family uh not really Wow. No, no. I got an Irish great grandmother, but other than that, <laughs> oh, the it's not like, you know, there. my parents aren't alcoholics. None of my aunts you. and uncles are like, I didn't, I didn't grow up seeing that, you know, so that wasn't part of my, my upbringing. It was just to crowd you around, man. It's, mm-hmm. it's so interesting, man. They're like, but you, to go back, you, so you graduated or you didn't graduate. I graduated. You graduated yeah, and yeah. then you went to New York. Right. Yeah. But why New York? Uh, sound like a, fun place to go <laughs> I, got, I mean i got a, I mean i got a job working okay. as a paralegal in a law firm but that right. was really yeah. an excuse to like go live in new york city yeah. and, and have when a good, did you pass the bar time. exam like so i then i went to law school at cornell upstate okay. and um, graduated in 94 oh here <laughs> so then um <laughs> i moved to palo alto to study for the bar exam i thought it would be you know i didn't want to go to new york city i was like yeah. i need a quiet place where i can focus um, and I'm, my, my plan was, I'm not going to drink all summer. I'm just going to study for the bar. Um, and I was living with my buddy, Pablo, who was a swimming teammate of mine. We were studying together. What I didn't realize was that not only was the world cup going on that summer, but that some of the biggest games of the world cup were going to happen at Stanford stadium, including right. Brazil. Yes. And so <laughs> Brazil descends upon this oh little college town wow. in the middle of world cup. And it's, Fucking mayhem, like partying yeah, all party. day, like just in, and there was just no way I wasn't going to, I wasn't going to drink. And so Damn. I just partied throughout world cup and then failed the bar exam oh. Holy <laughs> shit! <laughs> and had to take it again. Oh. I passed it the second wow, time. Man. Like, How long do you have to wait to take it again? Isn't it a long time? So I think, we, I think it's in, they do it twice a year. I think it was, yeah, you take it in like months. August and then I had to take it in February or something. Were you like entertainment that. Lawyer, lawyer? So initially I was a, like a labor and employment lawyer. Um, and then I was a corporate litigator. And then later after I left big law firm life, after I'd been sober for a while, um, was a entertainment transactional lawyer, like working with independent filmmakers mostly. Nice. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So I guess we're going to pretty much summed up a lot of that. Yeah. On my notes. <laughs> but the, and then you went to San Francisco, you said, right? Right. After, yeah. After law school, I lived in San Francisco okay. for two years and then moved to LA. Okay. Yeah. yeah and it's, and what, so it was on your 40th birthday where everything kind of, kind of came to a head, correct? Yeah, so, you know, just to bring it up to speed, I, you know, I ended up, you know, things, you know, I had that that moment of clarity when I was 31, like I just, I can't, you know, I just can't live this lifestyle mm-hmm. anymore. And I ended up going to a treatment center in Oregon, um, thinking I'd be there for a couple of weeks, the 28 day thing at most, and yeah. ended, ended up ended up living there for 100 days. Wow. Ooh. Holy which shit. is a long oh, time boy. to go to rehab. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was like, I, I, I went there and I just, you know, I woke up after I sobered up and just realized like, this is not this, you know, like from that kid who had the world on a string, like here I am like sleeping on plastic sheets in, you know, some basically a hospital, like my best thinking, like thinking I'm this smart guy who can, you know, do all this shit. And I'm in a fucking mental institution, you know, and I need to sort my hash out. And I started, I just made a decision, like whatever they tell me to do, like I'm just gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go all in on this. Yeah. And for the first time, you know, started telling the counselors like how I, you know, how I was actually behaving, what I was doing, like just was honest. And they just said, look, man, you know, you, <laughs> they were like, damn, you know, like, <laughs> first of all, like, I didn't do other drugs. Oh, so okay. you, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like I was a purist. Like yeah. go I was, you know, because I knew, I knew my relationship with alcohol was so dysfunctional. And if I ever tried cocaine, like it would be game. Oh I knew God. I'd love it. And, yeah, it and that would probably off. threaten my ability to keep drinking. Like it would destroy my life too quickly. And yeah. so out of self-preservation, like I was too afraid to f- try other drugs. So oh, I was really okay. a purist. But they were like, you have a case of alcoholism that we typically only see in, in like lifelong drinkers, like dudes that roll in here in their sixties. And you know, if you don't figure this out, like it's not looking good for you, bro. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, tell me what to do. I'll stay as long as you want. And, and that saved my life. And it gave me tools. You know, it was my first introduction to like s- spiritual principles about how to reconfigure how to live. Yeah. Um, and when I got out of that treatment center, 
I returned to LA and just immersed myself in the in the sober community here. Like it was just you know at least a meeting a day, if not two meetings a day. Yeah. The log cabin on Robertson was like my home. Like I was you know just and I just made new friends and those became my people. Yeah. I was just gonna say that that has a big impact of mm-hmm. who you're hanging out with. Yeah. Yeah. I just, I couldn't, I had, I needed a whole new crowd, yes. you know? Yeah. Right. And I had no idea that there were so many cool young people running right. around LA who were sober. Like right. that was like a epiphany to me. Like I, I had no concept of that whatsoever, mm. well, but I was were, still working in the law firm, you know? Okay. And, and, and then, you know, I, I knew I hated it and it was a slow process of like trying to extricate myself from that. And I left and then I was like a solo practitioner and then I had partners and was trying to do the entertainment law thing and all of that. And, you know, working really hard to make it happen because I didn't have an employer anymore. It was all on me. And so between 31 and 40, like it was all of those addictive tendencies just went into like trying to become a productive member of society again, (laughs) be a respectful human being who could show up when he said he would show up and look people in the eye and, you know, be responsible. And I was successful in that, but I really, yeah, I overlooked like, you know, my, my health and wellness. Like I I put on 50 pounds and was really medicating myself with shitty food and eating, you know, Jack in the box and McDonald's and takeout food in the law firm and, you know, blew up was too, I was never, I wasn't like morbidly obese or anything. I was like 210, uh, but just feeling like shit and lazy and not active in any regard. You went swimming at all during that time? No, I was doing, I was doing like nothing. Yeah, I was doing nothing. I had a big round head, you know, (laughs) 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 like the whole thing. And, wow, and that's crazy. And just had a mo- another moment of clarity, like yeah. one night, you know, going up the stairs to go to sleep and yeah. had to pause. Like I had tightness wow. in my chest and I was winded. You that know, was like, your birthday, right? Yeah, like right before my birthday. Mm-hmm. And it was very, it was an experience that I can only characterize as, you know, being incredibly similar to that day that I decided I'm going to go to rehab and being aware of how profound that decision was and how much it had changed my life. I was conscious of how decisions like this can be these levers for dramatic change in your life. And I, and I, and I was aware like, Oh, I'm having another one of those. Like yeah. if I jump on that time, you're like 40 years old. Yeah. Right? I was like yeah. 39. Okay. I was like, I have another opportunity here. Like you're lucky if you get one, I think I'm, I think I have a second here. Yeah. And I knew like, if I just said, well, I should probably eat better or go to the gym that that wasn't going to do anything. Like I needed to do something, you know, drastic on the Radical. level of like going to rehab, you know, like yeah. to reboot the operating system and just reframe like my priorities. And so that's what I did. Like I just, I channeled that energy the next day into, you know, kind of cleaning house completely. And that began with like doing a seven day juice, juice cleanse, cleanse yep. you know, which is kind of like detox, you totally. know, for drugs and alcohol, except for food. Yeah. And then went on this search to try to find a way of eating that would allow me to feel as good as I did on that seventh day of the juice cleanse. Because, you know, in that seven day period, which was horrible initially, by the time it was <laughs> over, I was like, I feel fucking amazing. Yeah. Like, I'm just, you know, the alcoholic in me is like, I'm never eating food again. Yeah. You know, know. I'm just going to yeah, drink I juice. Know this feeling. <laughs> you know, my wife's like, yeah, ca- totally calm down, trooper. The- you know, like, <laughs> she said, what? She's calm like, down, yeah, she's like, I think you need to rethink that a little bit. But, uh, <laughs> but you know, I had, I, I was enthusiastic about it. And, you know, I spent the next six months trying to figure out a way of eating that would make me, allow me to feel like that all the time. And, you know, I tried a bunch of different stuff and went vegetarian, but, you know, you play games, right? It's like, well, yeah. I can, I can get a Domino's pizza if I don't put meat on it, that's vegetarian, you know? And so yeah. I wasn't losing any weight. I felt like shit again. And I was kind of at the end of my rope with the whole thing. But the one thing I hadn't tried was going totally plant-based yeah. because I was scared of that. It just seems so severe and extreme, but especially back then. Um, yeah, yeah, this was 2005, 2006. Mm-hmm. Um, not that it was novel or new, but it wasn't like it is now. No, it's not like that. Yeah. Um, but you know, I decided like, I can't in good conscience just go back to eating cheeseburgers unless I at least give this a shot. And I, and so I did, my expectations were low, but within like a week of just eating nothing but plants close to their natural state, I was like, I, I feel like I felt on that last day of the juice cleanse. Like, this is unbelievable. Yeah. By like removing all these things I've been told my whole life are necessary to be healthy and critical if you want to be an athlete, I actually <laughs> right. feel better and I have more energy than I can ever remember having since wow. I was a teenager. That's amazing. It's, it's yeah, it's like, 
all those commercials like milk does the body good and the yeah. food groups you have to eat your whole life you're told you have to have these things to be strong and manly and all that you know it's really mm-hmm. embedded in our culture and, and yeah. media and everything you know we grew growing up with that surrounding us and it's so powerful extremely so powerful that even after you have that experience you still don't trust it mm-hmm. because you, <laughs> yeah. you have been told your whole life through these powerful marketing messages that are, you know, everywhere you look yeah. that you need these foods. I mean, the dairy lobby has, you know, those milk posters in high school gymnasiums. Oh, yeah. Like it's fucked up. Right. Yeah, milk does the body, all that. Oh yeah. It's, it's your calcium for your teeth. It's all better that. in my mind. But it's really people believe it completely. Yeah. They never questioned it. And Which even funny, when they you know? see a movie like Game Changers or they look at someone like Nimai Delgado, who's totally ripped up, bodybuilder, right. been vegan his whole, you know, he's yeah, never yeah. had meat in his entire life, they can't wrap their heads around it. So they just say he's on steroids, you know, right. because, mm-hmm. it's, because it's so anathema to the programming that mm-hmm. has been instilled in us since birth, basically. Yeah. Did you ever even think about a vegetarian or veganism before, before that? Not really. I mean, when I was in, when I was, I just always thought that it was like this thing that like hippie deadheaded people <laughs> yeah. do. You know, yeah, like yeah, I, I remember when I, I went to law school at Cornell and I had an apartment that was right across the street from the Moosewood Cafe, which is kind of a legendary okay. vegan restaurant in that kind of macrobiotic tradition. Mm-hmm. So my lens on all of that was just, you know, kind of, uh, you know, um, you know, 50 some odd old women in Birkenstocks, you know, like, <laughs> totally. at the, at the farmer's market or the weird, like natural food market. Like I, I, I yeah. never, I never, there was no one in my orbit who was living that lifestyle in a way that I found aspirational to me personally, nothing wrong with, you totally. know, a fifty-year-old woman who's into the Grateful Dead and wears Birkenstocks. Birkenstocks. You know, God, God, God love her, but yeah. it wasn't footwear. what I identified with. Mm. Yeah, because there was nobody like that back then who was part of mm-hmm. what we do that no, you could look it. at. Because everybody was like frail and, like you said, hippie and granola. Yeah, there was a lot of bad uh, stereotypes surrounding that world because yeah. not many people knew, you know, that much about it. Actually, at the time, right. I had an uncle that was that way he'd come and bring his own food and i never understood he's like mm-hmm. no no i'm good i got yeah. my own stuff that i brought you know was he vegetarian he yeah he was a vegan you know it's wow. for almost his whole life and wow. he was so much older from a different generation but it's funny in cleveland or where in was cleveland this? yeah mm-hmm. and it wow. was just like whoa what is he bringing but i remember yeah. as a kid like just watching him and looking at the stuff and i was like oh this hippie stuff yeah. the veggie patties that fell apart and stuff <laughs> <laughs> not even yeah. i mean it wasn't he was much older for Falafel. veggie patties you know uh-huh. it was really like more to you know from the earth to your plate mm-hmm. type of food but it's funny what you said about the juice cleanse like toby got me into that trying it your first juice cleanse this and year my, yeah. and, my, and nice. i did a few this this year and and it was that feeling though you know at the end of it it's just like yes yeah. yes and it's hard to go back to it food I know. After that. I know you know i was yeah, like, you know like what? let's keep going yeah yeah it's mm. but I, I i love you know hearing that you know people have that same vibrance you know from doing it because mm-hmm. a lot of people asked me after it because they were like wow you look totally different you know after right. doing the juice control like, scan everything like everything you yeah. know i was i didn't realize that many people would notice but like i noticed and yeah they'd be like what are you doing what are you eating you what lost are you like drinking? 20 pounds on the covid lockdown yeah wow. I, I lost yeah. a lot and that juice cleanse though put me over the top of you know that Wanting to find good stuff to eat after the juice cleanse because mm-hmm. it was impossible. Not falling back on like the heavy junk right. food vegan stuff. Exactly. Right. You know, you've, you've like rebooted the operating system and exactly. now like you have a, a greater uh, motivation to like eat clean and exactly. not, like not pollute the system. What's yeah. interesting about it is that, you know, now it's all about intermittent fasting and everyone's talking about it and shit mm-hmm. like that. <laughs> that was not the case before. Um, and there's a weird thing that happens because. You know, I don't know about you, but I'd never gone a single day without eating solid food. Like, how are you going to fucking survive, right? right? And then you have this experience, and the lights go on, and it it broadens your, it makes you skeptical, more skeptical of all these messages you've been told earlier, and more open to different ideas. Like it, you know, on a on a on a a mental, emotional, and spiritual level, right? Yeah. I had um, this cat, uh, Doctor Alan Goldhammer, on the podcast who works at he's the medical director at at uh, true north health institute up in like sonoma county mm-hmm. and they it's like the the first and biggest 
medically supervised water fast clinic in America. Wow. And he takes people through like 30, 60 day water only cleanses. And a lot of people come in with like serious, like Terrifying. chronic health ailments, you know, oh. diabetes, obesity, like all these problems. And it's extraordinary by how, by taking them through this process, he's able to wean them off all their meds and get them balanced out and get all their markers correct by not eating food. Yeah, you know? that's crazy, man. I, I, I the one thing I noticed from doing that, I had to occupy my mind, consist, consistently stay busy while uh -huh. on the cleanse. Like if I stopped for a little bit, I would start thinking about food right. and eating and I had to turn off like TV because every commercial was something about some horrible food, you know, being advertised. Make but ribs. I, make ribs. You well, know, it, puts you in, ribs. it puts you in contact with just how much we use food to modulate our emotions. Absolutely. Agreed. That's what I would And I remember I like being new in sobriety and I'd go to like AA meetings and people would talk about how they're like medicating themselves with food. And I was like, what are you talking about? Like I did not understand that until, you know, I had that experience myself and I realized like, Oh, when I feel like this, I just, my hand just, I don't even, I'm not even thinking about what I'm doing. Yeah. yeah. Especially on this lockdown too. Mm -hmm. Like just like the stress eating and stuff like that. Even if right. you're eating like some gluten-free snacks, you still like, I don't know. No, you're right. I mean, it can drive <laughs> you the emotions of, of wanting. Just eating when you're not it, even hungry. It drives you. Stressing. Yeah. yeah. Right. But it was great with the juice cleanse because I, I kind of cut off that, that thinking. I was like, you know, I, I need to be doing this and occupying my mind doing a bunch of stuff. You know, like yeah, going right. outside and walking around, going on walks, listening to music, you know, just really taking my mind off of that. And then I was okay. Uh huh. But I found when I was just sitting there like, hmm. Well, <laughs> I, uh, my wife's been drinking Diet Big Gulps for 20 years. This house was full of Big Gulp cups. And I, I begged her, forced her, manipulated her. I love you, baby, for listening. <laughs> to just go on a juice cleanse and try. This was a month ago. And she went on a seven-day juice cleanse. And she hasn't had... Diet Coke in over a month. Wow. It's incredible. And, I, I, and when I looked at the back of her car, it was full of all Big Gulp I've never seen anything like that. <laughs> <I was, laughs> they'd be in the dishes. Insane. I'd be washing her straws. Uh -huh. We have a drawer of straws right here, oh man. Oh, my God. It Addicted was... to Diet Coke. And now she kind of realizes that she has. she's drinking bubble water now. It's the whole thing of like the cup, going to her 7-Eleven, having this cup. It's, it's like a, a ritual. security ritual. It's a weird a addiction. Ritual. You know, mm. It's not just what she's drinking. It's the bubbles. It's the mm -hmm. whole process. She knew every 7-Eleven in the city, every homeless guy at every 7-Eleven. <laughs> oh, wow. And now, like, I changed her life. She, she was so bummed doing the juice cleanse, but now she's off the pop. Wow. That's great. That's powerful. That's, it's she's really... A, yeah. She's a good experiment. That's, like, yeah. crazy. Like, so addictive, that yeah. diet shit. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it really is. Um, okay, so <laughs> now now you change your diet on, your like, basically your 40th birthday, wow. losing weight. Um, never really ran that much, correct? Mm, not really. You know, yeah, I'd been an athlete, but I wasn't a runner. Yeah. And then I guess during that time, fast forward two years later, you're doing your first ultra, uh, ultra world championship Ironman, correct? Yeah. But you hadn't had a bike either really in a couple of years. You even had a bicycle, no? No. So Julie, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Never had a bike. So Julie, wow. uh, yeah, my <laughs> wife bought me a, you know, got, got me a bike for my 40th birthday. <laughs> I mean, basically, what happened Very supportive was, wife. you know, awesome. I, I, you know, after like, after like, you know, adopting this plant based diet and yeah. like having all this energy, I was literally like wired. You know, it's yeah. like my foot's tapping and like I'm just like, <laughs> I'm literally life. vibrating. You know, and Julie's like, get the fuck out of the house! Like, <laughs> you're driving me insane. So and much I, energy. I had to, you know, go outside and move myself for the first time just to like burn it off a little bit. So. Yeah, I started jogging a little bit. I went back to the, there's a little community pool near my house, hit that, started riding my bike. Not because I thought I was going to be an athlete again. Like yeah. I literally was just doing it to ground myself a little bit so I could sit still. And the weight just like came off effortlessly, yeah. basically. And it was remarkable like how quickly I started to feel fit again. Like it didn't take very long. Like I went from being this, you know, mushy couch potato into like feeling really good. Like I was progressing crazy rapid, you know, mm -hmm. and that also was like, wow. And I'm not eating all these foods that you're supposed to eat if you want to like, you know, get strong, be strong. Yeah. <laughs> but I was doing it despite that. Um, and that really kind of opened my eyes to like potential. Like it started making me think like, I, first of all, it was connecting me with joy you know it's like there's so mm -hmm. much of these these really simple activities that brought me so much happiness as a kid and i just 
you know, shuck them aside because when you're an adult, like you have to be responsible. It's, it's like yeah. this is that's an indulgence that we don't do anymore. And I just made this decision, like I'm really enjoying this and I'm going to keep doing it, and I don't give a fuck. Yeah. Um, was your wife vegan? But too, then, or no? no, I mean, she was always. I mean, that's the other like important part of this because she was. I mean, I met her in a yoga class. Like, she's a spiritual seeker, yeah. and she was always like, you she's know, official. wanting to sit at the foot of this guru or that guru and reading, you know, every book you can imagine about you know Eastern perspectives or self help. And you know, when I was pounding the cheeseburgers and overweight, she'd be like, maybe you should read this book or like, why don't you come with me to go see this person speak? And you know, the more she would. She she didn't nag me. It yeah, wasn't like right. she didn't wasn't really that attached to it, but she could see that I was like suffering and that I had a density, you know, yeah. around me and she was like I can help you. But the more she would do that, the less interested I became. Mm. And she finally kind of reached this point where she just decided to like let it all go. Like she's like can I be with this guy if he never changes? Yeah. You know, she had to ask herself that question, question. and yeah. she was like I think I can. Like I love him. So I'm going to really like, not in a perfunctory way, but like, I'm going to really like, just let go like of any attachment that he's ever going to change. And I, and I, she didn't tell me this, but I could sense the energy shift and suddenly there was a vacuum there. And I think what that did was compel me to suddenly take ownership of my own life. Like instead of her saying you should do this, like suddenly it was on me, like oh, I get to make this decision about how I want to be. Like, am I happy with how I'm living right now? And I think that accelerated, like, the growth curve. Like, that made me more willing to try these new things and, you know, got me into this place. But to answer your question, no, she wasn't totally vegan, but she was always, like, eating super healthy, much healthier than most people. Um, But when I I did the juice cleanse, like she was the one who helped me figure it out. And then when I was like, I'm going full vegan, then she like in solidarity, she's like, okay, I'll do it too. And then, you know, she really got to work in the kitchen and tried to figure out how to do it right so that it could be delicious and everything. So she's been a massive, you know, support system. I, I never would have been able to make all these changes without her. Yes. And you, so you quit drinking and eating meat around the same time, cold turkey? No. So I, I quit. I was sober like eight and a half years when I went vegan. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I got okay. sober when I was 31 and then okay. like went vegan when I was like 40. Got you. Okay. Yeah. Um, so then you got the, then you start doing the Ironmans. Like what made you even want to try that like two years later? Well, so, so I started just going out and running around and stuff like that. And I live in a part of LA where there's tons of trail. I'd yeah. never been on any, of the tra- you know where I live. Like the, I'd Monica never been trails. on any of those trails before. And I, I started, <laughs> I was like, I discovered them and I was like, I can't believe all of this is here. And I had no idea, you know, yeah. so I just started falling in love with exploring the area around, you know, my house. Um, and I had this experience after I'd been doing this for maybe, I don't know, four or five months or something like that, where I went out for a, a trail run on a weekday morning thinking I would just run for like an hour, you know, 45 minutes or something. And I had that experience that a lot of runners talk about where I just like dropped into the zone and I just felt like I could keep running forever. Like I just had boundless energy and I just kept going and I ended up running like 24 miles that day and I'd never done anything like that in my life. And I just thought, I can't believe I just did that. Like Mm -hmm. I didn't intend to, I didn't train for it. I just was like going with it. And that really started getting me thinking about, hey, what's up, man? What's up, man? <laughs> um, about, you know, trying to uh, um, test myself a little bit, yeah, right? Like I was, you know, I knew that like, I didn't really, you know, like my my athletic career, you know, just capsized because of booze. And, yep. you know, maybe I could do something cool. And plus that like, you know, oh, I'm 40 and I'm having a midlife crisis, so I'll do an Iron Man thing, (laughs) you know? Totally. So I was like, maybe I'll check out the Iron Man thing. And I started looking into those races and had knew nothing about it and quickly realized that you got to sign up for them like a year in advance because they sell out. Um, And I was like, I don't want to wait a year. And then I read an article about this ultra distance triathlon where you circumnavigate the big island over three days. It's like a 320 mile, like, you know, slug fest. It was just... I couldn't wrap my head around it. I just, I had no idea that human beings can do that, could do that or would voluntarily submit themselves to that. <laughs> it just blew my mind, but it, it like rented all this space in my head. And it was like this thing. I was like, I, I'm going to do that. Like I, 
I just I just knew I had to like try that. And that planted a seed that, you know, ultimately led to me, you know, getting into that race and preparing for it, yeah. hiring a coach and taking it seriously and then and then ultimately doing it a couple times and and you know, doing it doing it doing it well. Having never done like when I did my first Ultraman, I'd never done an Ironman and the yeah. only half Ironman I tried, I like DNF that. So it wasn't like I was going into it with some amazing, you know, pedigree or yeah. innate talent. For what does DNF mean? What does that mean? DNF? Did not finish. Okay. Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Must be a runner thing. Or, yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> I've heard of that. DNF. So that was 2008, 2009. So yeah, the first, yeah. the first Ultraman I did was 2008. Yeah. Um, and I went and then I went back and did it again the following year because I learned a few things and thought like oh maybe instead of just trying to finish let me see if I can be competitive yeah went back rocked it like the first uh, after it's done in three day stages yep. kind of like the Tour de France and after the first day I was winning that race by 10 minutes I saw wow, it yeah. and, uh, one of the top finishers in the Ultraman world yeah so Hawaii. I still have like one of the fastest the first so the first leg is a 6.2 mile swim and a 90 mile bike so yep. I finished that day like with a 10 minute lead on everyone Wow. And then crash my bike. The second day is 171 miles on the bike. I crashed my bike about 35 miles into that. And you still finished like six. So, yeah. yeah. And then, you know, it was all, it was all banged yeah. up, broke my pedal. It's a whole long story. But six place in the double marathon. Third day, yeah. Third day is a double marathon and kind of Damn. worked my way back up the field to finish six and that. Wow. So, so. And then, like, the one that's like, all the islands in like three days or something. Yeah. So this buddy of mine who I trained, who I trained with and raced with at Ultraman, this guy called Jason Lester, um, who is kind of a straight edge dude. He's a super inspirational. I heard cat. the name, Jason. I heard him. Yeah. He uh, he um, he's a disabled athlete. Yep. He doesn't have the the functional use of his right arm, and he still would do these crazy. Like, can you imagine swimming six point two miles with one arm? No. Like, guy does no. unbelievable stuff, and he's gone on to like run around Australia and run yeah, across, across America world, right? yeah. and all this kind of stuff. Um, but we had trained together and lived together for a little bit, and he came up with this idea of doing this thing that he called Epic Five, where we would do f uh, an Ironman on each of the five Hawaiian islands yep. and do it in five days. So an Ironman every single day going island to island to island. That's and originally crazy. it was just going to be him. He was telling me about it. And uh -huh. I was like, you know, knock yourself out, dude. You know? <laughs> and then he, you know, he asked me if I would do it with him. And, you know, at the time, like I got into all this stuff, not because it was less about being a competitive athlete. And it was much more about, uh, you know, being on a spiritual journey to try yeah. to really better understand myself and, you know, resolve this existential crisis about what to do with, you know, my professional career and yeah. the kind of man I wanted to be. Like, you know, I'd been on this path my whole life and I was realizing just how much of it had nothing to do with my own intentionality. Like yeah. it was really about fulfilling expectations of other people and fulfilling social expectations and trying to be respectable without ever really asking myself like, well, what do I want to do? Or yeah. like, what's meaningful to me? Like I'd never asked myself that question and training for these races and being in a, like a state of low grade suffering for, you know, many, many hours. It's like, it's like the, you know, the monk that goes into the cave and is like, you know, you're, you're trying to like, reckon with yourself and, yeah. and it was like this vehicle for doing that and I learned a lot about myself and felt like I'd come to some place of clarity by dint of doing these Ultraman races so when Jason's like let's do Epic 5 I was like I don't think I need to do that man like I think I pretty much answered what I you know it's like that's mm -hmm. a lot of suffering you know a lot, man. but you know I also felt like no one's ever tried that before yeah. like it's crazy like how can I how can I say no to that? Like, mm -hmm. so, you know, I was like, I got to do it. And yeah, we ended up doing it. It was a crazy adventure. It took us a little bit longer than five days, but we got it done and it was really super meaningful. And it's now turned into like an annual event and people do yeah. it every year and, you know, women have finished it and people have done it much faster than we have. Oh, and it's wow. pretty cool to see the legacy of that. Yeah. Were you still a lawyer? Were you doing that too? Yeah, I was still, I was like less and less interested in being a lawyer yeah. and more and more interested in riding my bike. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as a result of that, <laughs> like we went through a lot of financial suffering. Um, and that kind of lined up with the crash in 2008 and yep. people losing, you know, their jobs and all of that. So it was a, it was a, it was a, it was like the universe had created this situation where I was really struggling financially and I was, you know, trying to you know do these hard things 
I was really unable to like pay a lot of the bills. We almost lost our house. And, you know, we had to like really burn in the flames to come yeah. out the other side. And I feel like that was like, that was like, uh, um, uh, like, you know, hell year, like what the yeah. SEAL teams go through. Like I had to go through that so I could emerge the other side. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, a more actualized human being. And I'm, I'm grateful for that experience now, but it was really fucking hard. So what did you end up doing as far as like survival from like, what was your job after that? I mean, I was, I was working as a lawyer, but you know, I was, I was like representing independent filmmaker clients who didn't have any money, you know, it's like, <laughs> you know and, and I was out training all the time and you know, we were just really scrapping. Like it, it got so bad at one point, like we had our trash bins taken away from us because we couldn't pay the 80 bucks or whatever. They read that needed. actually, yeah. And you know, we would have to put the the garbage bags in the back of this beat up minivan that we had and find a, find like a, a dumpster somewhere to dump them. And, wow, man. And you know, our electricity would, would get turned off and our gas got turned, you know, it was like, it was, it was not good, man. And we live in a, you've been to my house. Like yeah. I live in this beautiful house. Like we were the- That was the house we were like about? the wow. poorest <laughs> rich people ever. Cause if you look at our house, it's like, it's a Amazing. fancy, it's a nice house, right? Beautiful house, man. We couldn't pay to keep the electricity on though. Wow, you know? man. So, and the bank was a calling, you know, yeah. and it's crazy that we were able That's to the same ultimately house talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. So then what changed? So, I mean, obviously the podcast didn't start so, until like 2000. Yeah, I mean, what happened was, was uh, so I do these races and that attracted some media attention because yeah. like, why is this, this like, dude in his 40s is a lawyer is like killing it at these races um and he's doing it vegan like how does that work and so superhuman people were super kind of interested in that story yeah. and like cnn did a piece that like sanjay gupta came to my house and we did it so i was like getting it was crazy because we were getting all like i remember sanjay gupta comes to our house to tape this thing for cnn wow. and Damn. julie's gonna cook him lunch nice and she's ready to like turn the thing on the burner on the stove and she's like i don't know if the gas is going to turn on <laughs> wow <dude. laughs> That's crazy. we told him that story later like it was holy shit that, but so it was this juxtaposition where i'm like getting all this attention but i can't pay the bills and that's very emasculating like i had a lot of shame about that too mm. as a householder as a head of a household and with kids yeah. and it's like all this pressure was like mounting um that's but right, ultimately kids. I was able to get like a book deal, right, to write this story, and I got a, a you know a, an advance, which sounded like a million dollars at the time, but was like you know enough to like pay some bills. It comes in installments, so yeah. it wasn't really enough to support a family of you know four people, six people. Yeah. Um, but you know at least it was something, and I was like, I you know I'm writing this book, and so then all my focus was on writing this book, yep. which while you're doing it, you're not you're not really making enough money, but. Um, you get like a little teeny advance or something. But I got, right yeah, now. yeah. But, and I got it done and then the book came out and the book did its thing and you know, I'm getting more and more intention, but I'm still not making really any money. Uh, and, and we were so broke at some point and I, you know, I just trusted in the universe. I was like, yeah. I have to see this through and like doors will open. We just have to have faith. Like I can't go back to doing what we were doing before. And even in my darkest moments where I was like, this is intolerable. Like, let me just mm -hmm. go back to a law firm. Julie was like, no way, man. Right. We've come wow. too far. Like, Even it though you had if we lose the house, the table, if we lose the house, it's like, it's just stuff. But like, you know, we're on this path. And she's we have amazing, to see, man. Yeah, it's incredible. It's incredible. Because most people would have been like, you've lost your mind. And we had yeah. plenty of friends who were like, what are you doing? You know? <laughs> Um, so finding ultra comes out like and so the book comes out and I, you know, I do everything in my power to like push it out into the world. And it does, it wasn't like a, people think it was this New York times bestseller. It wasn't, you know, it, it, it did okay. But, okay. um, but, um, that kind of runs its course. And then I'm like waiting for the phone to ring with some opportunity and it's not ringing. <laughs> you know, I was like, what now it was the movie deal? You know? <laughs> yeah. And what happened was this guy calls me up who had read the book. And I'd met him one time and he was this baller like business dude. He'd been, he'd been business partners with Mark Cuban. He was co he was co-founder of this company broadcast.com okay. that kind of put Mark Cuban on the map. Like it was the biggest IPO of all time at that moment. Yeah. And Mark went on to become who he is. But this guy just kind of cashed out and said, I'm done. Like I don't need any more money. And he bought this, this like mango plantation in Kauai and he was, trying, he was trying to turn it into like a, an event space or a community kind of oriented 
place, and but he wasn't sure what to do. And he's like, "Hey, I've got this spot. Like, why don't you like you just seem like somebody who could help me figure out what to do? Like, will you and your family like come out and help oh, me?" Man. And he's like, "I'll pay you." No one else was, you know, calling me, and I was like, <laughs> it was like a godsend. Even though it was weird, and like I'm like, yeah. I don't know, I don't really know that I'm qualified to do this, but sure. Nice. So we packed up and we moved to this farm. And we lived in yurts on this uh, on on this property for like three months. Wow! And um, and it was a really cool experience to get out of L.A. And we thought like the Where bank that? the bank's going to take our house. We may not go back to L.A. Like we might be here. You know, I don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, um, on the north shore of Kauai, okay. like near <laughs> in uh, Kilauea, You've been which is like a couple yeah, times yeah. with our Ironmans too, yeah. in Hawaii. Yeah. Are you yeah, sick of mangoes? There, so, <laughs> a lot of mangoes. <laughs> we love um, mangoes. That's all we talk about. I but I started I to get, I started to get island fever. You know, yeah. I started. Okay. I, I'd worked so hard to like create something and to connect with people, and suddenly I removed myself from like civilization. It felt uh, like, and I was yeah. like, I don't. This doesn't feel right. Like I feel like, you know, I had this like need to do something, and that was the impulse that ended up leading me to start the podcast. I mean, okay. I'd been. I'd been like an avid, rabid fan of podcasts yeah. from day one, like be, especially because I was spending so much time training. Like I'd go out on these eight hour bike rides mm. and I can't listen to music. Yeah. And I'd listen to audiobooks, but Why not I, music? I discovered yeah. it's just like for that long, you okay. know, it's just, it's just too much. But I needed okay. something to that my mind could focus on, yeah. you know, that would take my mind off the, the pain that I was, I was gonna you know, ask you like kind that. of that low grade, grade pain. And, you know, at the time, I don't know if you were into podcasts like back in the day, but probably not. You had to like <laughs> go to iTunes on your desktop computer and then you would have to download the MP3 file and then you would have to like wow. bounce it onto an iPod. There was no iPhone. There iPod. was no streaming or anything like that. You had to download the. Into and so I would create these playlists. OK. Um, and you had to be very intentional about it. But then I was I would listen to hours and hours and hours of. You know, whether it was like, I mean, Rogan had started, there was Adam Carolla, a lot of comedians like Adam, Adam Carolla, Carolla uh, Kevin Smith was doing podcasts. There weren't, there weren't that many, but there were a couple cool ones. Yeah. And I just thought this is unbelievable. But I was the only person that I knew that listened to podcasts. Like I didn't <laughs> yeah. know any other person. I was, and I would go around evangelizing it. Like there's a whole world here. You can like learn <laughs> and people talking. And I thought it was unbelievable. So I'd probably listen to hundreds and hundreds of hours a podcast, you know, before most people had. And I realized that nobody was doing anything all that interesting or compelling in the kind of health and wellness or personal yeah. development space. And I thought, I, you know, I know some cool people like, you know, maybe let's just do this. And, you know, I just, my sons are musicians and they had mics and I figured I spent That's a day cool. trying to figure out how you get these things up on iTunes and just wow. turned turned mics on one day with Julie and just started rapping <laughs> with no expectation. It wasn't like I'm starting a podcast. Yeah, I was like, right. well, let's just do this and see how it feels. And thought that was fun. Like, let's do it again tomorrow. Like that was cool. And yeah. that's really how it began. Uh -huh. um, so two things. So had you ever to writing a book, had you ever written anything before? Were you, are you a writer? I mean, I'd been a, you know, I was a, I'd done a lot of creative writing in college okay. and I was always pretty good at writing. And then as a lawyer, you're writing all the time. So yeah. I, I was, you know, I was confident in my ability to write, but I'd never written a book before. It's you know? therapeutic, yeah, yeah. right? To do that? Therapeutic and horrible and terrifying <laughs> and painful. Yeah. Um, and then also like recording for the first time, hearing your voice, were you ever confident on the microphone? Was it weird? Like, I'm just gonna record myself talking. Like, I mean, it's weird. Like I've gone back and listened to episode one uh -huh. and it's, it's like it's pretty much the same, mm -hmm. you know. I mean, I've gotten much better. You have a great voice, man. But I, I hate listening to my like. I, I try never to go back and listen to any of it because I cringe. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you feel about hearing I don't your to my voice shit either. No, but um, but you have a good, you have a great voice and a face. Some people say you, you have a, you have a great face for radio because you can't see it, but you're a handsome guy. So you have a face for TV and <laughs> yeah, you have a good voice. No, but your voice is so um, soothing right now, and he's. Like, out of anybody in the podcast, no disrespect to you, Derek. Okay. He he actually talks on the mic, and I can hear him. There's so many people that step away. <laughs> yeah, you, I know, you I know, bastard! I know. I'm, I'm talking yeah. up on the mic. Today. But he's very professional. So so your name's <laughs> kind of out there now. You have a book out that's doing well. It's not the bestseller, but it's it does it does pretty well. You're being humble, mm -hmm. and people know who you are. So I'm just going to do a podcast, but it has nothing to do with the book. You're just trying to ways to express yourself, and you know, you listen to these podcasts, you get inspired, mm -hmm. so you start recording it. Yeah, I mean, I just started recording it. It was you know, it was. I, I was very clear in the beginning, like this is not going to be a podcast about how to train for a triathlon. Like I, I realized like yeah. if I want to, um, 
you know, have some kind of career that would have any kind of longevity at all, I'm going to have to, you know, do something a little bit more broad because there's a shelf life on being an endurance athlete. Right, yeah. Right. Um, and, and, you know, I'd learned so much as a result of, you know, being in the recovery community and, and by being involved in the endurance community, I want, and I was like, I've, I've just basically blown the lid off my potential in certain areas, but I'm also so blind in all these other areas of my life. Like I want to continue to grow. So you now where else, where else can I learn? Like, who can I learn from? Like, what am I curious about? And I, yeah. you know, I, I really wanted to cast that broad net from the beginning. And what was interesting is that, um, you know, podcasting is so competitive now and there's a million oh, yeah. podcasts and everybody's so doing it. But at, in, in 2012, like, you know, episode one, like right to the top of the charts Dang. and like wow. in, and you know, we were able to like, you know, get a foothold in those rankings right away, even though we probably got a thousand download, you know, it wasn't much, it didn't take anything but at you that stayed time. Because the was, top and then just was, you know, has been a, a, a function of just, you know, holding on to that geography. It's like he's putting out like singles on billboard yeah. number it's one for like 10, 20 yeah, years. Yeah, I mean? like, I'm curious, like why, why do you think that it, that is? Why your podcast above all because it's great and he's well, the first one talking about that type i mean of stuff it, at then. the time okay. no one else right. was really doing yeah. it and then you know the algorithm does so favor like, like new shit when you have a new show they artificially inflate it and you don't realize that when you're okay. a new podcaster you're like holy shit everyone loves my stuff you don't realize mm -hmm. that like the computer is putting it in front of people you know in a, in, in, you know for a period of time <laughs> right. but it's enough to like make you excited and encourage you you know i, I got see. enough encouragement to like keep going and then ever since then like i've never missed a week but I did wow. it for years without monetizing it. Like I, you know, I did it for a long time before it became something that could pay some bills. Yeah, I want to talk to you about that off the air after that. Yeah. But you and your wife did like a best-selling cookbook too. Mm -hmm. Not too so long then, after yeah, that. Yeah. So then she, yeah, we did a cookbook. We've done a couple cookbooks, um, and then you know, the slowly the phone started to ring, and like you know, we've all we've been able to like you know put the whole thing together. But it took a long time, man, long time. So how long how long have you been married for? How long? We've been together for 20 years. Amazing, man. Uh, married for 15 years. Yeah. That's awesome, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's your rock, man. This everything so far you're talking about. Yeah. Had your back through everything you've been through, man. Like, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, the, the stupid adage comes up like, oh, behind every great man, there's a great woman. And it's like, that's <laughs> annoying because in this case, like the man's not great. Like the woman is like the powerhouse rock who was able to like see the better man within and hold that space for him. And, you know, she allowed me to like grow. She um, believed in you and, too. Yeah, she believed that. in me. She believed in me when like nobody else did. And she had the fortitude to like live that truth even when the world was crumbling around us. And every people were telling her like, yeah. what's wrong with this dude that you're married to? <laughs> it's it's <laughs> always like those people yeah. on the side, they're like, what's yeah. wrong with you? Like, he, he's a plant-based runner and he right. runs, writes books and he has a it's podcast. Like, what's a podcast? He's yeah. like, you need to get out of that. Yeah. <laughs> but then you become, then you're, then you're in like men's fitness for the 20, 25 uh, most fittest men in the world. Yeah, so the, yeah. That's pretty sick. Don't believe everything you read, but that's like a... <laughs> But, pretty but, uh, for but, your age, but that's good. You know, like I can, I can like hang my hat on that and it opens doors up. Yeah. You know? So, so then you drop in the books and the, when did you realize the podcast was like something special? When did you start realizing that this is like your, is it, it's pretty much your full time thing now? I mean, yeah, it's, it's, it, it takes, yeah, it takes up most of my time now. I mean, it really was just a slow build. Like there yeah. was never any kind of crazy inflection point. I've never had a viral moment or anything like that. It's really just kind of grown piece by piece over the years. And I think just, you know, the, the lesson is just like consistently showing up for it, you know, yeah. and I've approached it the same way that I approached becoming a swimmer or, you know, right. going to law school. It's just like you work hard every single day and, you know, you, you pay attention to, you know, stuff like you pay attention to the details and, yeah. you know, you do the things anonymously that no one sees and that stuff adds up over time. Yeah. It's super inspiring. This, this from like, from a John Joseph to a Matthew McConaughey, like the diversity of the people on your podcast. It's, it's awesome, man. It's yeah, super it's inspiring. Been, it's been really cool. It's been it's, really, it's been, and it's just, it's such a gift as you know, you yeah. know, to be able to like have these kind of conversations with people. It's really meaningful. And the fact that other people connect with it, you know, I think it's, it serves a, uh, you know, a need in our culture. Like the more we become this soundbite clickbait, you yeah. know, um, society, 
the more starving we are for something that has meaning and mm-hmm. authenticity and honesty. And it takes us back to that hard wiring to sit around the campfire and mm-hmm. just tell stories and, you know, connect with human beings. And, and you know, it's like, it, it, it's like this oasis in the midst of a really broken media yeah. environment. Have you, have you um, been inspired to change your life in a certain way by being inspired by some of your guests? Yeah, it's weird. Like, it all just goes into the hopper, you know, in yeah. some weird, in some weird soupy way. It's not like, oh, I heard this, and so I immediately started doing this. I mean, there's certain people that you have on that give you very practical, like tactical things to do. Whether mm-hmm. it's like Wim Hof with the breathing and the cold water, and yeah. or the intermittent fasting or things like that. But overall, it's just it all just kind of goes into your, you know, subconscious on mm-hmm. some level. I think, and if there's any theme. You know, these are all people who have found a certain truth that they live and they do it, you know, to the best of their ability and they're authentic in that regard. And everybody's overcome obstacles and, you know, weathered hardships to, you know, be the people that they are. And I just find inspiration in everybody's story, whether it's, you know, somebody super famous like Matthew McConaughey. But I think the real value, like for me, there's 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 an extra level of personal gratification when you have a conversation with somebody that like no one really knows about yeah. that you just think has yeah. a crazy awesome story and you get the opportunity to help amplify that. Yeah. Like that's, that's, that's like a really cool thing. I love it. Two things. You just said the word soupy, which I caught. Mm. you caught. That's a very New York East coast <laughs> word. That shit's soupy. Yeah. soupy. You never heard that word soupy? I've never heard it now. Just to hear Rich Rose say Like soupy. the way you, you said it, like Rappaport would say it. <laughs> exactly. But him saying that it's a very New York slang thing. Um, <laughs> Oh, fuck. Oh, and then we have your book comes out tomorrow, November 10th. Mm. Seven yeah, years of the podcast. Eight years, right? Eight it's years? Been a, yeah, it's coming up on eight years now. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so I wrote this book called Voicing Change, and it's like a- Conversations matter. Yeah, it, it's a it's a coffee table kind of introduction to the podcast where yeah. I've excerpted um, aspects of 50 conversations that I've had over the years out of the 550 plus people that I've had on the show. So it's timeless wisdom and inspiration, you know, lifted from these conversations with beautiful photographs and essays that some of the guests have contributed. And of course, my thoughts and really, you know, the message is that meaningful conversation does matter. And I think, you know, it's never been more evident than it is right in this moment when we're on the backside of this crazy fucking election. Yeah. And we're seeing the breakdown of society and our inability to communicate, um, communicate with each <laughs> mm-hmm. other and cohere as a community. Like there really is this fracture in our culture. And you know, irrespective of whoever you voted for, we all have to live together, man. And we've got to figure absolutely. out how to do that in a healthy, productive way. And I, I strongly believe that you know, long form conversations are the path forward because they emphasize subtlety and nuance and we realize things are not black or white and it's not about this tribe or that tribe or what team you're on. It's about the shared humanity that unites us. And it's about understanding that our differences are small in comparison to the things that we share. Oh, absolutely. I, I love think the that. idea that you said community has you know, such a strong meaning, you know, it's something that mm-hmm. we really lost, lost touch with, you know, and in so many ways, you know, when I yeah. think about times when there were like block parties you know, you'd know the people in your neighborhood, or at least where I grew up, there was like, you know, that sense of community that was so important, you know, that yeah. really brought people together who came from different walks of life. Like Dave Chappelle was saying, where you grew exactly. up. Exactly. That's what in I was Ohio. getting to that point. Yeah. You saw the Dave Letterman interview with uh, Dave Chappelle. I did, yeah. And Just, was, I wanted to live in a small town after that. And, yeah. it, and it's really that, I think that's something that a lot of people can really understand and start off with the people that are surrounding them mm. that not thinking about people overseas or anything like so much that you know for people to get their head around the idea of community and get back to that i think they have to think what's in touch with them what they can actually right. you know that's real to them so your neighbors you know the people are living around you having that connection is super important i believe and, yeah. and you can be different people you know it's just that communication is just and a mutual respect. Absolutely. Right? The and respect a, and a, and a, is very And a important. genuine good faith desire to try to understand where right. people are coming from. And I think, you know, we think or we, we've been lulled into believing that Twitter is like a proxy for like how culture really is. And, true. you know, we see the videos and we, you know, scroll through the vitriol and we just think that that's how everyone's interacting with each other. And it's just... 
it's not the case. Like when you got, how many interactions do you have in your daily life that look anything like what you see on Twitter? Like when you're boots on the ground and you're interacting with people, there might be, you know, a crazy situation yeah. like I saw in Austin with Alex Jones driving down the street in a, in a tank or whatever. But <laughs> for the most part, you know, the, the interactions that I have with human beings every single day are, are, you know, a testament, a testament to, you know, the innate kindness that most people have. And, yeah. um, and you know, that desire that we all have to understand each other. I agree. And, and this lockdown show me with my neighbor is like all through the beginning of COVID at eight o'clock, all the neighbors be outside. We make a noise for the, um, essential workers and this meeting new neighbors on the street and everybody coming out together supporting that Mm -hmm. we've been talking to some neighbors around here who maybe are are for trump or now having these like serious conversations during this lockdown you know what i mean having conversations with other people in my neighborhood like but all living in the same area you know right i feel like that's something positive that came from this there's just something from the the lockdown that you've learned about yourself or something maybe you learned how to cook something or something Mm. did (laughs) something different from this lockdown or just kept the same how has the lockdown changed you not changed but (laughs) not changed but something positive out of it i mean that's a good question or you you just kept on your same everyday life nothing really changed for you well first of all i would say i'm super privileged because i've been able to continue doing the podcast which is how i make a living and a lot of people don't have jobs you know so that has remained intact and pretty much the same although i have to do more stuff on zoom than i would prefer but (laughs) but you know i'm lucky in that there is that kind of cornerstone of of my life that i've been able to like maintain that aside like i went into at the very beginning of lockdown i'm like I've been fucking training for this my whole life, man. I got this thing covered. Like I'm introverted. My greatest ambition is to be left alone. Like I don't want anyone to like now I can like clear my calendar, all this bullshit that I had that I was supposed to do. I don't have to do anymore. Like this is unbelievable. Yeah. I can say no to stuff and like I can just lock myself in my shipping container and like write and like do my podcast and it's going to be awesome. And what I've learned is that Despite all, despite that um, introverted tendency, uh, I've realized that uh, I miss my friends and I miss humanity more than I would have suspected. Uh, and it's put me in touch with just how important community is, yeah. something that I've overlooked. And so, you know, I've started making a, a, a stronger commitment to stay connected to the people that I care about and my friends. Yeah, I love that. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. But you're still doing your runs in the canyons, all that stuff. You're still out yeah. there. Yeah. You sleep outside still or no? I st- yeah, I sleep outside in a tent. <laughs> yeah, straight I couldn't up. believe that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you're you telling saw, me that. If you've been to a south, yeah. like, why aren't you sleeping in the south? So <laughs> th- you still do that. I still do. I prefer it. I but sleep better. It, does your wife join you? Or you come? No, she's like, do your thing, dude. Wow. Like she's like, you know. Wow, dude, what <laughs> is know. That? So what is that connection? What is that? So, what is that? well, it started, it started <laughs> because. You, you told me that. I, I should not believe it. I love it. Go ahead. So. <laughs> I like the bedroom cold. Yes. Julie likes it I warm, do too. you know? And yeah. when the when it's co- like when it's cold and I can get on underneath all the covers, like I just sleep better, yeah. you know? That's true. But my wife gets freezing. And so we would bicker. She, you know, we would we would argue over the thermostat. I know this argument. And no matter, yeah, see like Every time I tell this story, every dude's like, totally. Like, <laughs> I always show these. I always totally. show these. My wife likes it cold, too. I <laughs> she does, totally you're, get it. You're, an, you're an outlier. Too. You're an outlier. I hate air conditioning, too. I do, too. But like out. here in L.A., even in the middle of summer, like in that desert air at night, it cools down. Like you, get, there's all, It's always a cool night. So we would meet in the middle, and then she would be freezing underneath all the covers, and I'm sweating, sleeping on top of the covers, and neither <laughs> of us are happy. Right. And... One night, a couple of years ago, we did, uh, with the kids, we did like a sleep out. We have a flat roof, like, and we have a wall and you, we had a little projector and we projected Sick. movies and we like had, had popcorn and like had sleeping bags on the roof and, and just crashed out and slept on the roof. And I had this unbelievable night of sleep. Like I woke up the next day and I was like, I feel unbelievable. Like <laughs> that, I was like, I'm going to do this again. She was like, fine. But you, what happens is you wake up and you're covered with like condensation, yeah. like everything's soaking wet. And so I was like, well, I got, now I need to get a tent. And she was like, fine, get a tent. And it really just started from there. And I just turned it into a habit that I've stuck with. And I just find that I have a more restful sleep and mm-hmm. Julie's happy. Everybody takes it as a referendum on our marriage, which it's not, you know, I think, I think, yeah. a lot, I think, 
I think it's, I think there's a stigma. Like if you get married, then you you share a bed. And if you're, if you go into the other room to sleep, that there's something wrong with your marriage. Mm. Um, but in truth, like, you know, our intimacy is fantastic and we get it, you know, in other ways, but we both like have, you know, part of our relationship too. And I think one of the reasons that it's been successful is that we're both independent people and we don't, we don't need to be like, you know, attached to each other all day long. Yeah. Um, so, so how many years you've been sleeping in the tent now? It's been like maybe two and a half years. Wow. Yeah. And how long you been sober for now? For, I got sober in 98. Wow. But I had a, I had a relapse after 13 years. In 2011, I slipped up for a day. What triggered that? I had made Good question, training. Derek. I had, yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I had made training for these races my higher power. That's the truth. Mm. Um, and I had, it's not that I decided I was no longer an alcoholic, but I was not prioritizing my recovery program to the extent that is needed for me. Gotcha. So I kind of was going to less AA meetings and I okay. wasn't really working the steps and I was justifying it like, well, I'm doing all this training and it's good for me and I feel good and my life is getting better. Okay. And so it's this very subtle kind of like sliding out, you know, they say in recovery, like every decision you make, every thought you entertain, every behavior that you indulge is either moving you towards a drink or away from a drink. Like there's no stasis. And I forgot that. Like I started to think like, I'm cool. Like I don't need to go to all these meetings anymore. I've been sober for 13 years. And also there's an ego component to that. Like I became the guy who could like walk into the meeting and be like, Oh, he's the dude with 13 years. Like he's got it figured out. He's right, got the answers right. and, mm. and I could drop the bomb share and everybody be like, man, he's so fucking wise. Yeah. And, <laughs> and that's a really dangerous yeah. thing. Mm-hmm. And I think the universe needed to right size me. And so wow. I did this, I was in Hawaii and I just done my third Ultraman in 2011 and it didn't go well and i had to pull out of the race like i didn't finish and i was devastated because i trained so hard like i was in it to win it that year yeah and it didn't go my way and and um i had lost touch with the tools that keep me sober and i was with my family at the beach and they were kind of down the beach and there was a open beach bar at this resort and before i knew it i was like let me have a beer and i had that beer was in my belly and i was like that was good let me have another one And I threw four beers down my gut, you know, before Julie and the kids started walking up. And I was like, holy shit, I just, I'm like drunk now. Holy shit. And she could tell immediately. And then I was at an AA meeting that night. So in the grand scheme of relapses, it's pretty fucking lame. It's a pretty lame relapse, but <laughs> no, I was waiting for like a but, uh, winter. We went on for like a week. But, but you know, listen, beers, a lot of beers. yeah, but a lot of people like it. It then it it like sets in motion that cycle of craving, and a lot of people don't find their way back. And I was sure. lucky enough to get right back in, and I had to call you know my buddies and tell them that night what I'd done. It was like so humiliating because I was the guy with time, and and then to kind of come back to the community and like tell everybody what happened was like so embarrassing you yeah, know the guy but, 13 years before, but it was yeah. like this beautiful injection of humility that i needed right, and it reminded right. me like you know i'm i'm just a i'm a you know i'm I'm a garden variety drunk and i'm a servant among men mm. and that's allowed me to create a better connection and relationship with um with my recovery and also with myself right yeah. like i just i got out over ahead of my skis you know mm. and and I needed that kind of like uh, come up and check. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Does your wife drink or is she sober? No, I mean she's she's a total normie. Like she'll have a glass of wine like, once, like once a too. year or something like that. Which yeah. I I don't understand. My wife that, likes that four. My, <laughs> my wife likes that. <laughs> I get, get it. That's my wife shit right there. Four roses. I, my yeah, wife drinks that hard. Drink. That's the, if she drinks, she drinks yeah. that whatever that is. Drink of choice. Yeah. Um, one thing you just came out with too in the Squire was how to survive the next few weeks with grace. And one thing I like, because one of my questions is, what are your daily rituals? And you said you do notes of appreciation. I thought that was really cool. Mm, yeah. Gratitude list. Yeah. Yeah. So you do that every day? Pretty much every day. Um, I don't want to say I do it every day, because there's certainly days that I miss. But I definitely prioritize that and make a practice out of that, mainly because I'm not naturally a grateful person. Like, I'm, as said, I said you, in that article, you said the like, article. You said I'm that. a pain in the ass. Like, I'm selfish, self-seeking. Mm. I'm an egomaniac. 
I, you don't come uh, off like I'm, that at all, I'm irascible and I'm, you know. Unless you're acting, you come off, I'm you're just, very humble, dude. Dude. <laughs> yeah. I don't live with you then. Ask my wife. Yeah. <laughs> so I have to do that as a reminder to myself. And that's Check another, yourself. it's another practice of humility. And, and, you know, gratitude doesn't come, doesn't come gracefully to me. But when I can connect with it, like not only am I happier, like the people around me that I'm interacting with are happier that I'm doing that. Yeah. And, and and your kids are they into like running or swimming or anything? None of them. Into? None of them. None of them. No, wow. not no sports it at all, whatsoever. Man. Yeah. Wow. No, I got two. <laughs> my two boys are musicians. Yep. Okay. They're getting ready to cut their first album right now. Nice. Six. And then as soon as COVID lifts, they're going on tour. Wow. They're wow. unbelievably yeah. talented. I mean, they have a band. They do. It doesn't have a name yet. Okay. But uh, they've been playing. I mean, Tyler picked up a guitar when he was six years old and never okay. put it down and trappers the drummer and they've been writing songs together forever like they're oh, the ki- little incredible. kids who would just play a set every time we had a dinner party and and now like they've just progressed into unbelievable songwriters and, and musicians so cool. and they're working with really cool people and you know are you I a musician at all no no not at all but wow. julie that's julie's side of the family her okay. brother you may know did I, did I ask you this before do you know Stuart mathis I may even know the name. So J- Julie's brother, Stuart, he lived in Hollywood forever. He's moved to Nashville now, but he he was in the Wallflowers oh, and yeah, he and played Wall- with Lucinda. He's Lucinda Williams, guitar player now. Wow, okay. He's been, he was Jules' guitar player. Like he wow. played with a lot of people. Okay. So it's like that side of the family mm. for That's sure. That's amazing, man. So they're, yeah, they're like, you know, night owl musicians. And then I've got a 16 year old daughter who's a visual artist. She goes to art school. Cool, man. Um, and a 13 year old daughter who's like into like anime and cosplay and like all this cool <laughs> Japan <laughs> Japanese stuff. None of them have any interest in the things that I do. And I think it's kind of beautiful. Like is, that's the way is. God rigs it. Like, totally, you right. know, I want to like, let's go camping. Let's go like, let's go, you know, out on the trail. And they're like, no, nah. they like, they, they don't like the beach. They don't like, <laughs> did they oh, trip out? Are you sleeping in the tent? Are they tripped yeah. out? Are you used to they're, that now? I mean, they're used to it. Like they don't think anything of it. I mean, they may have to talk to their therapist about it later, but <laughs> you know, this beautiful house in Calabasas yeah. and my dad's in the tent. Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Dude, I think um, it's fucking incredible. You, that's, you're literally grounded. You know what yeah, I mean? That's yeah, fucking. Yeah. So yeah, daily rituals. I mean, we pretty much covered that. And then are you a big music person? Um, like a favorite group or something? Yes and or? No, I mean like I'm an, I'm like, I'm stuck in the bands that I fell in love with when I was like in my early twenties, which is probably true for most people. Right. Like, okay. like REM is like, Whoa. that's my shit. That's great. You know? Yeah. REM. REM changed my life. They're my, they're my guys. Wow. Man. Um, you, you know, Michael I like radio, you know, Radiohead. Like that's like my vein, you know? How about Michael Stipe on your podcast? That'd be sick. I've been trying to make that happen, man. I love that guy. I might, yeah. I might know somebody have one person. Yeah. I might know. Yeah. That's, yeah. That'd be awesome. I would, I would, I would love to talk to that guy. Um, wow. What about punk rock and stuff? No, I was never like a punk rock guy, and it's I like funny. That. Like, I that. you know, I, I, uh, it's funny because I'm friends with so many yeah. punk dudes now, you uh-huh. know. But I don't come like I grew up. I grew up in D.C., but I was like the prep. You know, I went to like I was like you know my parents are like out of like the polo catalog. You know what I mean? <laughs> like I was not going to the nine thirty club, mm-hmm. even though the nine thirty club was down Shit. the street. Dude. And it was all going on there. And I knew about it, but I just never was part of that community. And I was, look, I was just swimming and, you know, doing my thing at the time. Then you're in New York by CBGBs too, and that was yeah. never a thing either, yeah. right? No, no, no. What about hip hop? No, my si- my 16-year-old daughter is like my my muse on that. Like okay. she's the one who's like teaching me what's up because she's all about that. <laughs> um, she's all about that. And that doesn't come easy to me. Like it's not my natural you never liked hip hop growing up, really, or no? No, I wasn't like yeah, I was. I was definitely like an alt rock dude. Wow, is there anything yeah. about Ritual that people don't know, as far as music taste, or something poppy, or like do you like Katy Perry? Do you like just some pop stuff? Some I like everything, stuff? man. I know we talked about this when you were on my show, which by the way was like an amazing episode. Dude, like, thank I you, appreciate man. that. Thanks for like, having people, me on there. People loved it. I changed my life actually. Um, but but what's what's you know what I love and appreciate about you? Uh, one of the many things is just your enthusiasm for all genres and not being like a snob about stuff like that because people get so caught up. That's another form of tribalism, right? And yeah, the fact that true. you're you're Thank so you, public about like, I love this and I love that Hopefully. and you're so positive and it's all good. <laughs> um, Thank you, man. I think is a, is a cool thing. And I don't, you know, like I, I don't like, I would say hip hop is tough for me, especially like the hip hop that my daughter listens and to because she's such a strong mm-hmm. feminist 
sensibility. Like she's a powerhouse, right? Okay. Like don't get in her way. She doesn't take any shit. I love that. But then she listens to this music where mm -hmm. the lyrics are so, didn't we talk about this? Like it's uh, so misogynistic. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, how Absolutely. do you reconcile that? That's and how do these gate, how do these musicians get away with this in the era of me too? Like they get a pass. I, I, so I tell me, talk do. to me about yeah, how that works. I, I, I do want to break it down. Yeah. Rappaport brought this up. Right. That, in the middle of everything happening in, in the world right now, I'm not going to We talked about this, me and you, yeah. that the song WAP is the number one song in the country by um, Cardi B. And I'm going to say it on the podcast, it means wet ass pussy. That's the number one song in this country. I'm being honest. <laughs> yeah. And the fact that that's the number one song with everything that's going on and this girl is doing these challenges, mm. young girl is doing these challenges on it's stuff. True. I'm not judging. It's her choice to do that song. But I'm saying like that's a huge song. And it's very... right. It's crazy to me. I, I, I have a hard time getting my head around it. Like too. nothing, like this more positive, influential uh, hip hop could be coming out. This we love Run the Jewels. You should check out Run the Jewels. Killer Mike. You, the Jewels. Kill, you know you're Killer Mike. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's amazing. I mean, yeah. I like like you know my my hip hop sensibility is like digital planets. Yeah, digital like, planets. You know yeah, stuff man. like that. Like like Star high Ball like Quest. yeah yeah exactly like kind yeah. of high vibe. You know. Like Robert Kanye, he's like your neighbor, Robert heavy. Kanye. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, no? Um, but you know what I'm saying about hip hop? Yeah, like, it's songs that young know. girls are listening to, and feel. And obviously, we, we we talked about his podcast a while ago. It's a Kardashian world, and people are inspired right. to like. I, I mean, it's a, it's a mm. it's a difficult thing because as an artist, you know, you you want to have that freedom. You know, that's that what I love about right. art. You know, that expression, what you're feeling. There's people that have these different feelings. They're different from mine, and I have to be able to respect that in a way. We're talking about I had right. to, but if you had a daughter. If I had a daughter, a you know, it, it, <coughs> I mean, or, or even a son. You know, I wouldn't want a son to be acting, you know, the certain way that certain rappers are talking about, you know. But they're actually telling stories, some of them, mm -hmm. you know, from their world. So it's a world that I'm not from. Right. Yeah, so, I it, so it's something that I can't really yeah. relate to, so I don't listen to it. Yeah, but we both love, I love Snoop Dogg, but I never tried weed. I grew up listening to Snoop Dogg. Love his music, respect it, but I'll never smoke weed because of right. it. Right. Absolutely. I mean, I love but the there's beat. But there's yeah. a weird, there's a positivity with that dude, at least, right? Yeah. I mean, oh, I can get down with like sure. Kendrick Lamar or yeah, like yeah. Chance the Rapper or, right. you know, so Donald, Glo shit. Donald Glover. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. I mean, like, This Is America is like the anthem of the moment right now. Yeah. If, like, True. we've learned anything. You know, waking up to the fact that 67 million Americans voted for Donald Trump. Just go back and watch that video, and Facts, you realize, yeah. like, this is this is the America. It, we didn't. It did. Th this didn't just happen. This is the America Absolutely that we've bad. always lived in. Oh yeah. So, yeah. To go back to what he said though, about right his, his daughter, who's a feminist, but she listens to hip hop that may be a little more misogynistic towards women. It's hard to separate the two, I guess, because it's music. You can dance to it. There's kids doing dances that are online. There's contests. There's mm -hmm. memes. There's TikTok. Mm -hmm. But maybe maybe people aren't really digging into lyrics as much as the beats and the choruses. I don't right. know. I, but we grew up like, in different hip hop. I, I mean, yeah. hip hop has always been about telling stories. Yeah. You know, they may not and be And I appreciate that. that. And I right. think art should have the bandwidth and the freedom to be fully expressed Absolutely. and not be, you know, um, censored in any way. Right. Whether it's, whether it's stand-up, comedy and Dave Chappelle and everything that's going on in the comedy world where people are afraid to tell jokes yeah, now. That's this is not good for no, culture across the board, it's irrespective not. of whatever your political proclivities are. Right. But at the same time, it's not affecting your daughter because she still has her beliefs. She listens to this type of music that may be saying right. something, right. but she's still, it's a, just, yeah. a, and we talk about it and I'm like, how does that work? And she's like, I think it's funny. Or like, I just, I don't, that's not the part that's meaningful to me or whatever. Like right. seriously. Right. I, yeah. But I mean, there was like, there's, it's you know, a weird juxtaposition though. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, when there was certain things that came out like uh, in WA and it was just like, fuck the police. And I was like, I like this, but I have respect for the police. Uh -huh. And, you know, right. because I, at that time <laughs> I was like, I think I might even want to go into mm. law enforcement, you know, I really have, or like be a fireman. But I could see that they were telling a story about getting fucked with by the police. It's and their it's like life experience. The yes. And I was like, okay, if you look at it in that way, just like you're looking at a movie and they're like killing people all over the place mm -hmm. and everything. And it's an expression in a movie. I, you don't take it literally where it's like, okay, this right. is how it's going to be and blah, blah, blah. This is how I have to be. I mean, I, I love music for the fact I like hearing those stories in hip hop or certain their life experiences, but um, it doesn't necessarily mean that I have to turn into that type of person or exactly. I'm having that experience right. or anything. We can see about punk rock when it's like, 
all this shit about anarchy and fuck your parents. Like, I love my mom. She raised three boys on her own. I wasn't going to be like, fuck my mom because <laughs> right. this punk rock band yeah. told me to hate my mom exactly. or hate the government or hate this or never mind but, the bollocks. But I got the story. aspect of them like question certain mm. authorities that are in front of you. Question everything, actually. It's yeah. smart to do that. And that's the at, what I took from music and the punk rock and hardcore scene. Like yeah. that ability to question what's put in front of you, not to take everything right. and just have it be that's the way it is. Right. Rich, right. do, you have, do you have any top five like in, in, uh, inspirations or anything? Or like an artist or like a writer or anybody that really helped inspire you? Think about top that. five favorite authors. Yeah. <laughs> top <know>. five. <laughs> if you don't have any, but somebody that like, really stuck out, like inspired you. And... Top five athletes. Um, top five hip hop. That's tough. Like, I, I want to I try to like answer it honestly and not yeah, just yeah, like yeah, come course. up with like the greatest hits. I, I mean, up, I okay. remember. Never it's hard. Happened. Yeah. I remember seeing, well, there were two filmmakers. Like, I remember seeing Blue Velvet for the first oh, time. Oh, yes. Great fucking movie. And it, just, it, it, just, it just blew my mind. Incredible that movie. That could be what a movie is. And it gave me a deeper appreciation for the art form and and the variety of expressions that yep. y- you could you could do with that. You know, as, as, as sort of disturbing as that movie is, <laughs> there's, so much, there's, there's Frank, a crazy... Geez like, you know, Love wild it. beauty in it at the same yeah. time. Um, and I would say, you know, similarly, um, Sex, Lies, and Videotape, when I saw that movie, oh, yeah. Fuck, um, that, that changed my movie. perspective on, on cinema as an art form. Um, and I saw both those movies kind of within maybe a year of each other, I think. Like, I think uh, it, it was around 89, 90, I think, okay. when both those movies came out. Um, and that is what like made me interested in independent film as an art form. And awesome. ultimately, you know, I became a, an entertainment lawyer really as a shadow artist because I was too afraid to express, you know, my own truth, but I wanted to be part of that world. So those, yeah. those, 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 those both made a big impact on me. Would you ever direct like a documentary or produce something? I directed like a short film that did the, the festival circuit in 2005 called Down Dog. It was like a parody of the LA yoga scene. Nice. And then I wrote, a, I wrote a feature script <laughs> and I actually had McConaughey, I had a meeting with McConaughey's production company. Back then? And he was really interested in doing the movie. Yeah. Oh, like, wow. Really wow. wow, man. Fast it didn't forward ever, now. And it, yeah, it's funny because I just wow. had him on the pod. It, it didn't end up happening for a variety of reasons. But there was a moment where I thought I was going to pursue that world. Yeah, because you, yeah. you love, you have so much admiration for it. Yeah, it'd be interesting. You could probably do a cool documentary. You what about I'd, you? I'd like what to about do, you? I'd like to do it. I'd like to make a documentary, actually. Yeah. Yeah. About your so, life or just? No, no, no. Not about my life. <laughs> Somebody should do a documentary about no. your life. That, if ne- <laughs> if Netflix is listening. You should do a documentary about your life. <laughs> right, down to the last two. So do you have any regrets in your life? Oh, I have tons of regrets. They don't haunt me, though. Like, okay. I've made peace with them. Like, I've, I've made so many mistakes over my life. And, and, and part of the, you know, part of the process of, of recovering from alcoholism is you know, reckoning with those decisions that you've made and, and, you know, figuring out what motivated them and, and tackling the character defects that precipitated them and ultimately, you know, making the amends and then finding peace with all of it. So I can, I I can talk about all those things that I've done that I'm not proud of, um, but I can do it from, you know, a place of, of, of equanimity. Like I I am at peace with those, those things. Yeah. I love that. And it's a dumb question because I know it, no dumb question. Are you an optimist uh, or pessimist? But I know that you're. Yeah, I'm an super opti- posi. I'm I'm opti- I'm optimistic, but I but I like I don't have the level of optimism that you do. Like I, <laughs> I have to like I have to fight for my optimism. Are you more in the realist? same way? Yeah, I'm more of a realist. Like no I can get glum and I can go dark. Like I don't wake up every day like fired up PMA coming out of my fucking eyeballs. You know, like I have to like do a little bit of you know work on myself to get into that place. I mean, fundamentally I'm optimistic and, and I, and, but I, it's, it's almost more of a choice rather than like my innate nature. Yeah. I feel like for me too, it's been really challenging to be in my PMA bubble during this. So you can't avoid everything happening in the world, especially in this lockdown. So I never, I don't know if it's called depression, but I have felt mentally beat down the past six, seven months. Mm. I got I, something I never felt before. Even if I'm living in a house, mm. I'm healthy, my family, I'm married 25 years. I have my career, all that. It, you, you can't avoid the beatdown of everything happening in the planet. Feel yeah. the pain and all this shit happening. It's 
it's hard, man. It's, yeah, it's hard. It's a to struggle, man. Well, that. I think it's important to acknowledge that. Otherwise, the PMA or the positivity comes off as as um, inauthentic or Pollyanna. You totally. Know what I mean, like if you're not if you're not feeling the heaviness of what's going on right now, then you know you're not like you're not really honest, <laughs> honestly, you know, grappling with what what's actually happening. And I have been doing over this past couple months posts about depression and and fighting it. And people are like. You okay? You know, you're you supposed to be the guy we look up to for them. Like, yo, I'm a fucking human being, and like, I, yeah. I turned fifty in my yard. Uh, just, just you know, just weird things that happened during this lockdown, like not seeing your friends and not playing music and doing what you love and all that. But it's like, it's very true. and everything with politics, which I'm not a really political person, but you have no choice but to be involved now. Mm-hmm. And the COVID, just everything, man. Like the 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 rabbit hole of your phone. So you're like, if I go to the ocean, I shut my phone up. We go to the ocean. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. But you go on this phone and you want to. You know, lead by example and promote things that you're doing and your brands and music. And but then you go down the rabbit hole of like conspiracies oh, yeah. and this side and that side and fake news and real news. And you're on these mass texts where people have different beliefs. It's just it can be draining. fucking it's, draining. How do you how do you uh, like reckon with like what to say and what not to say on social media? Because like I Straight struggle point. with that. Like like I could be on Twitter all day, you know, blasting out my political opinions. But then I'm like. Is that helping anyone? Am I am I just signaling to the tribe that like I'm a member in good standing of this particular point of view? Like, and point. I and mm-hmm. and I feel an obligation and a responsibility to, you know, stand up for what I believe in. But I also don't want to just be a prisoner of that echo chamber or just another kind of, you know, voice in the in in the void. Yeah. For to what end, you know what I mean? Like the only, like the main motivator for me is like, I don't want my daughters to look back and say, you know, what were you doing in the middle of all of this? Like, were you a voice for change or were you just, you know, uh, standing on the sidelines? Yeah. It's hard to cipher. Like some people want you to say something or some people say it's not your place to say something or stand back or, you know what I mean? It's tricky, especially right now, what you do and what you don't do. Mm. You know, if you feel like, Hey, I I have nothing to say right now. I'm, I'm absorbed. I'm taking it all in before I speak. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, a lot of times I just like to stay focused with work, mm-hmm. posting or anything that has yeah. to do with social media. I try to keep my family out of it mm-hmm. or things that I really feel close to me, but I try to post things that are related to work and try to stay in a, in a very open uh, playing field as far as like I want people to know this about me, these things about me, and I want to present myself in this way and that's as much that I can let people know that's yeah. let good for me. Yeah. yeah, let people in. And so I think that works out best. I never get in an argument. You know, if uh-huh. anyone's writing anything negative, delete, block. Yeah, you, that's yeah. it. <laughs> you <laughs> like, never win an argument uh, on the internet. I yeah. learned that for and, sure. And you never will. I'm always saying to you, it's like, don't reply to them. They're waiting they, for they a They want reply. your attention. They get right. your attention right like, back to them. They anything win. they want, yeah. like a little, little anything. I've they're, learned that on this for sure. Like, you know, yeah. They're searching for that. You cannot win an argument on the internet, man. It's hard. Yeah. It's hard if you don't it post or be. say one thing or. But just, I, I, I tend to just block it all. I block that stuff. You know, it's like next. Blocking you know. somebody mm-hmm. feels so wonderful, man. It's just <laughs> an incredible feeling, man. Like, especially if somebody's just hitting you up all the time. It's just like. I, I, I had, I had a uh, one question uh, for Rich. Like what is like, how important was spirituality in your transformation and in your life now? How does it stand? You know, I, I know it, I've heard you say, do this conversation that it has, you know, big significance, but in your transformation, because you, you said you came from a family that Sunday going to church. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. um, so did you have to walk yourself back when getting sober? Because I know part of the AA program, spirituality is yeah. a big part of it. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's to me, I mean, I look at it all through the lens of spirituality, like it's all a spiritual journey, you know, and, and all the changes that I've been able to manifest in my life are a result of, of that spiritual journey that I've been on. Um, yeah, when I went to, when I went to that rehab, mm. you know, and it was impressed upon me that you know, the 12 steps are a spiritual program. I have all this baggage around religion. Like it just never, That's why it, wasn't, it wasn't yeah. like, you know, I saw priests buggering kids or I didn't have that kind of like, you know, negative experience in the church, but I just was never able to connect with it. Like I would go to church and sit there and just think like, I I can't, I don't, you know, Mm -hmm. like this is not working for me. Like I don't understand why, you know, I'm here. Um, So I had to unravel a lot of that and separate like the institutions of religion from 
a broader spiritual perspective and, you know, develop an openness to that. So today it doesn't take the form of any particular strain other than being open to, you know, uh, a more kind of, um, sensibility around like mystical energies that we can't see that aren't, that aren't, you know, available to our limited senses. It's a great answer. Yeah. Yeah. Is it a struggle to be sober this right now or no? No, I mean, I don't, I don't really think about drugs or alcohol. Yeah. You know, it's not like I get cravings or anything like that, but the struggle is emotional sobriety, right? Mm -hmm. Like you remove the drugs and the alcohol, but you're still an alcoholic. Yeah, and, right. You know, no, without, so. without me kind of diligently treating myself for that condition, my alcoholism will show up, not necessarily in reaching for a drink, but in, you know, bickering with my wife or, yeah. you know, just being selfish or, or isolating. Yeah. Like that's a so big one with me, is, right? Is yeah. Awful. Or like indulging my ego right. or, <laughs> you know, or compulsively, you know, scrolling on my phone or oh, you know, right, there's a, any, right. anything to take me out of like just being present. Do you suffer from uh, being so. on the phone too much too? Even at Yeah. It's a battle, you know? Yeah. It's a battle. It's so crazy um, that Steve Jobs said he was going to create the extension of the human body, and that's what the phone is. He did that, and it's mm. funny that he doesn't let his kids really like he was saying. Really, none yeah. of the none of none of the none of the designers of these technologies allow their children. Did you see the social dilemma? Did you watch that? Yes, that, man. Yeah. So they, they all say them, like yes. they don't let their kids. Yeah, that was hard to watch, man. That was like holy crap. So man. That's the most important movie of the year. Yeah, because I, I agree, if man. we can't solve that problem, we're fucked. And yeah. I think so much of what we're seeing right now with this election cycle can be traced back to Absolutely. these platforms and how, they, so and, true. and how they really pit, pit, pit us against each other. Yeah. What's the other one we watched though about the COVID just came out on Netflix. Um, it is incredible, man. Yeah. It's from the first scientist in Wuhan, uh, the first doctor in Seattle. I haven't seen this one. Yeah. And it breaks down the time frame of everything, how, how the, the president knew about it, the gap over the month where things could have got... It is really mm. you got to pull the name real quick. I so know, people call. I gotta is it like I'm working on it? Is it like uh, it's some? It's like a sentence. It's uh, I know. I I know, know what, what you're talking about. Yeah. I can't remember yeah. the name of it. It just came out, right? Yeah. Well, think about it, Derek. Well, okay, you go on and talk about something so tomorrow, else. November, so, so tomorrow, <laughs> November 10th, uh, the new book comes out. Um, Voicing change. I just got a copy of it. It's a beautiful book. Thank you for this. You're welcome. Uh, that's exciting, man. Yeah. Thanks, man. How long did it take to put that together? Uh, it was a team effort. Um, but I really started focusing on it at the beginning of the pandemic. Okay. And so we've put it together wow, it's quick over the course of this and we're, we're self publishing it. Yeah. So we did it all in house. Um, Richard, oh shit. That's awesome. Which is man. why when you go to Amazon and look for it, you're not going to find it because it's only available on our website. That's kind of cool though, man. It's really um, cool. Yeah. And the idea was to just own it completely, control it and, ultimately turn it into a series because I can do one of these every year, yeah. like a new edition every year because I'm obviously I'm interviewing, you know, 50, 60 people every year. It's so, it's so cool. So. That's so DIY to put out yourself, yeah. man. It's so... Love, yeah, it's, that's my... So see, I am I am like sort of punk rock, you right? You are, dude. I saw you sign like 600 <laughs> of these last week or yeah. something. You signed yeah. like 600, right? And already? I signed 700 the other day. It took me five hours. So the pre-order has been great. Like, so, wow, yeah. man. It's been good. Really inspiring, man. Like your whole life, like your journey, everything you've been through, where you are now. I mean, it's like, it's really powerful, man. I'm honored to call you my friend. I really appreciate you being on your podcast like almost a year ago and you coming on mine and just the way you changed your life and even your marriage and your family. It's it's awesome. You have a beautiful life, man. Yeah, thank you, man. It's, uh, it's, a, it's an honor to be here today and I've got crazy respect for not just everything that you've done, but the kind of man that you are, the kind of uh, partner and father and just the way you carry yourself in the world man thank we need, you man we need we need more examples like you so thank you mad respect i appreciate it and derek thanks for being here this is the best you yeah, the best this, you, this is like your real first time with a microphone and headphones on yeah. here and i'm gonna add you to the show we'll see what uh, happens thanks. you have some great questions derek thank you uh, for having me <laughs> what, what, it's a pleasure to be here <laughs> what, what is that documentary called though i'm, I'm, I'm working on it that's what it's called here, it's I'll called like i'm working on it yeah uh, work in progress no no no, no i gotta I, uh, hang on a second we'll i'm gonna find it i'm gonna yeah. be the first I, to find it. everybody stay tuned on here hang on a second um i'm checking my text oh right my now God, all the listeners hang on a second Working, um, working it? No. No, do I have it in my text? I texted you. <laughs> I know, but I'm I I'm sorry, can't. everybody. I'm sorry, everybody. I'm just going to pull it up right I'm now. Sorry, I should be able to pull this Hang up out. like they do on those. Uh, Rich, where can they find you? Where can they find all your stuff? Uh, go to richroll.com. That's where all my stuff is. Uh, you can uh, order voicing change on the website, richroll.com slash VC is the direct link. 
uh, my my podcast, Ritual Podcast. You can find it on my website and also wherever you listen to podcasts, and we put them up on YouTube as well. And I'm just at Rich Roll on all the social junk. And what about Finding Ultra? Where is that? Um, you can get that on Amazon or also through, if you want a signed copy, you can get that through my website also. Okay. So, uh, uh, yeah, anybody find this movie real quick so we can plug this I'm going to find it. Oh, it's going to drive me uh, crazy. I'm pulling back right now, rewinding. Derek, I'm looking through our text right I, now. I uh, updated my phone. Come on, so just look up. Just look up just totally look up. under control. Yes. Yes. Jeez. Yes. There this, you this, go. This, Thank you. All the listeners, whatever you believe, whatever oh politics you're involved God, in, what you think about Corona or not, uh, totally <laughs> under control on Netflix is a really powerful, and it's scientists and doctors. It's yeah. like official people talking about the situation they're in right now it's, it's very, very really good. interesting man and is uh, it john joseph approved i don't i don't know i don't know if, i don't know if he's seen it <laughs> shout out to john joseph I don't know if john jo- i'm gonna send that to john after this. I'm, gonna text it. I'm gonna text it to john joseph but yeah it's a great doc um it's really interesting no matter what you believe hope people out there are safe and they're healthy your family's everything we're gonna make it through this uh, me and Derek will be on the stage somewhere next year, hopefully somewhere. I hope maybe so. we guys watch us out of your cars maybe we'll be in bubbles <laughs> we don't know um Oh, you you done doing you done doing Ironmans? I don't know, man. Never say never. I did a ra- I did a I did a crazy race two years ago. So every couple of years, I like to mix it up. And how old are you now? Yeah, fifty four. You look great. Wow. Dude. You're aging Thanks, wonderful. Dude. The beard's coming in white fast. Yeah, though, the beard, yeah, the, yeah, that you know. comes the beard fast. Looks, <laughs> yeah, but the, yeah, but the I beard know. looks good on yeah. you though. <laughs> And you so, got a great hairline too. Oh, thanks, man. Perfect hairline going. <laughs> on. Um, <laughs> thank you guys for being here. This is awesome. Uh, pick up that book tomorrow. Not on Amazon. Um, Rich Roll. <laughs> right. Right. Thanks for listening, guys. Thank. Hey guys, thanks for listening. Um, please rate, review, uh, subscribe. If you haven't subscribed yet to this podcast, please do that. And whatever platform you are listening to this on, I'm glad you found me. You can rate me and review me on there also. So thank you guys sincerely for the support. I cannot wait for you guys to hear the next one.